I call this Wednesday, April 28th meeting to order at 7 p.m. Secretary Campos, please take opening roll call. Arthi Kalor. Here. Aliyah Federoff. Um, Anne Marie Round Sorensen. Brandon Walker. Here. Kara Flagel. Here. Carter Gangle. Here. Kathy Zhao. David Morgan. Here. Donald Impavito. Here. Emmanuel Almonte. Here. Hope Steger. Here. Holden Ingalls. Jasmine Bolduck. Here. Jason Nelson. Here. Janelle uh, Luazo. Here. Jordan Diebler. Here. Uh, George Durango Espen. Here. Joshua Reynolds. Here. Caitlin Farrar. Here. Kyle Quinn. Lakin Meter. Here. Lewis Richardson. Here. Marie Missiner. Here. Maria Gillespie. Here. Matthew DeAngelis. Here. Um, Megan Neely. Here. Michael DeBowen. Um, Michael Jablonski. Tired, but here. Noah Robertson. Here. Patricia Barungi. Raina Alexander. Here. Refugio Lara. Ryan Lascalzo. Here. Samantha Brown. Here. Here. Uh, Samuel Aja. Here. Sean Terry. Here. Selena Go. Here. Seth Kornstein. Here. Steven Zhang. Here. Sydney Gibbard. Here. And then I realized I skipped Najee and Aaron. So Najee Rodriguez. Here. Aaron Bowes. Here. Okay. Was there anyone's name that wasn't called? I know that Anne Marie can't unmute Ashley. And I know okay. that Kyle also indicated that he was here. Okay. And we do need a two thirds of active representatives um, to pass policy. Um, Secretary Campos, can you confirm that that is the case? Yes. Thank you so much. All right, we will now move on to the adoption of the agenda. If, are there any motions to be raised? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Representative Meter. Hi, Lake and Meter at large. Um, I motion to add resolution 316 in support of advocate Penn State's double Pell campaign under line item H in new business. Is there a second? Okay, seeing that it's seconded, it has been added. Thank you, Chair Meter. Representative Robertson. Noah Robertson, College of the Liberal Arts. Um, I motion to add resolution, sorry, <laughs> 416 to the agenda under um, line item, I believe it's I now. 
and seeing there, is, there are seconds, it has been added. Okay, are there any other motions to be raised? Seeing none, we will now move on. Representative Lascalzo, I see you have a point of inquiry. Yes. Um, I know that we are uh, my oh, Ryan Lascalzo, Lion Pride representative. My point of inquiry is I know we're passing the budget tonight and it's the last uh, day of the semester. I believe the UPUA generally suspends the budget after passing it. Is that its own line item or is that just done after the budget is passed as like a different thing in the jig? I believe our executive director of finance and Speaker Gibbard is here. Um, Speaker Gibbard, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I was going to motion to suspend it like after we present, after we pass the budget, but I can also motion to do it now, whatever. I think it's, I was just wondering if it was a line item on the agenda or if it's just like a motion that someone makes. And I think Stephen answered in the chat. Okay, seeing that that point has been resolved, we will now move on with our agenda. We will move into the adoption of the minutes. Is there any discussion on the past meeting minutes? Seeing no discussion on the past meeting minutes and the adoption of those, we will now hear a special presentation on the budget from Speaker Gibbard. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna share my screen. And Speaker Gibbard, you will have five minutes to speak and then you'll have 10 minutes to field any questions. You may begin whenever you're ready. All right. Oh, sorry. All right. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, we will be, um, me, President Bose, and then Executive Director of Finance, McFarland, are gonna be presenting on the 16th Assembly budget presentation today. Hi everyone, so I'm the Executive Director of Finance, just to remind uh, those who don't know. So I just kind of wanted to show like at a glance, the last year's assembly budget versus this year's assembly budget. So the main changes that we made were with the assembly discretionary and then with the operational sub budget. So you can see that we decreased the assembly discretionary about $3,000 and then we increased the operational sub budget that same amount. Um, and then the show cause sub budget remained, remained the same. So just to explain a little bit about what each of those categories are, the assembly is essentially the, the assembly discretionary is, is essentially the assembly is free to use that discretionary as they see fit, obviously within the, uh, the student fee board um, guidelines and of course within ASA guidelines, but it's essentially how the assembly believes they should best spend their money. Um, then the operational sub budget is key to the operations of the UPUA. So it includes the presidential and speaker discretionary conferences and supplies. Uh, and it also includes programming like the mental health wellness week and sexual violence awareness and prevention. And then finally the show cause includes various services to all of the student body or most of the student body. So that includes the student handbook, test prep resources, capital day, and a couple others that we'll go into a little bit more depth in the next few slides. And just to explain how we're gonna be doing this presentation, anything in green is an increase in the budget reallocation, anything in red is a decrease, and then anything bolded was either removed or newly added to the 16th assembly budget. And so just keep in mind that any reductions that we have are because we spent approximately $500 to $1,500 less than the new budgeted amount. So that's why we, we saw it fit to uh, reduce that budgeted or that allocation. Thank you. Well, moving on into the operational sub-budget breakdown, um, most of this in here stayed the same. So as you can see that within the discretionary usage, which is broken up into presidential and speaker has stayed the same from the 15th to the 16th as well as the operational costs, which cover conferences, facility rentals, and general office supplies. Um, the, the main change here is a decrease in the EPA Elections Commission. This decrease um, accounts for in the past, we were able, um, or at least we were moving in the direction of being able to reimburse candidates um, for campaign spending, but because of the student fee board um, and kind of our interactions 
um, and, and the guiding policies within the student fee board handbook, we are no longer allowed to um, reimburse candidates for campaign spending. So that's that's a majority of, of that decrease within the elections commission. The Department of Communication, oh, sorry. And then the other two stay the same, you're good. <laughs> um, and then here you'll see um, a couple of increases. So in mental health and wellness week, you'll see an increase. Um, we are looking to optimistically expand tabling and our, our programming within mental health and wellness week. Um, which obviously will come with an additional cost. So we're looking um, in those realms to expand and, and increase the budget there. Sexual violence and prevention, you'll see um, almost it, it double. That, that, be, that is because we've decided to combine Red Zone Action Week, um, which Red Zone Action Week looks to um, target sexual violence and prevention that happens within the first week of being on campus within the fall semester. Um, and so we decided to combine those two um, line items into one under sexual violence and prevention. And we also this past year had spent an additional sum of money on speakers and honoraria. And we wanna make sure for such an important week and such an important, important, important um, programming and, and event matter um, that we have the budget and, and the money, the allocation to spend. PSU votes, you'll see a decrease. This is mainly because um, we're, no, we're not in a um, federal election cycle this year, but we also still want to have enough funds to spend on primaries and local elections. Um, so we decided to do that $1,000 decrease. And then World Cultural Week, which what didn't happen in the 15th Assembly, mainly because um, it's very highly targeted on food and catering, usually, um, and also a lot of more of those in-person events. Uh, but we decided to keep it the same because we're hopeful that we can get back to that type of programming in the, in the next year. Um, yeah, so um, Aaron kind of touched on a little bit of the takeaways for each of the reasons why we either decreased or increased things, but we kind of summed them all together so you could see them all in one place. Um, so like Aaron mentioned, um, mental health and wellness increases by 1000. Um, they went over budget last year because it was one of our only programming things that we really got to actually invite speakers in and then do things also um, more on the ground related. Um, we also think that this is going to be extremely important in the next um, year as we return to in person and people adjust to those lax COVID, COVID regulations um, and what that's gonna look like and affect students. Um, another thing is that we increased sexual violence awareness and prevention by 7,500. Um, we went way over budget uh, last year, um, almost $20,000 over. And that's really a product of the fact that um, we brought in a lot more speakers um, and we were partnering with a bunch of more offices on campus and we had the resources to do so. Um, but in moving forward, we think that this is gonna be an extremely important topic as we return back to per in person. Um, there was also an increase in sexual assaults on campus this past year. Um, so we think that it's a really strong target area for the UPA. Um, we also, like Erin mentioned, combined that Red Zone Action Week into the overarching SFAP budget, which has been done in the past. Um, last year was actually the first year that they were separated, um, but we think that it, we see it as more of like a year long effort that we'd like to designate money from one singular um, area from. Um, PSU, vote, um, PSU votes um, decreased by 1,000. Um, and so last year was a presidential year. Um, so we definitely allocated a lot of those resources there. Um, we also did speak to the chair of Gov Affairs and the previous chair of PSU votes, um, Noah and Lakin, about these things. And we're all on the same page there. Um, and another thing, um, the Elections Commission decreasing by 2000. Um, Tony recommended this. Um, she helped us a lot with like forecasting what the budgets looked like from previous years and then what we can see in um, future years. Um, we did confirm this change with the head of the judicial board, Jordan Zaya. And um, in the past, last year, they spent only about $500. Um, and so we're looking to, we know, we know that it's gonna be in person next year and he really wants to expand reaching out to people um, and, um, just like really making sure that we're engaging with students before the election. Um, and then also the assembly discretionary decreased by 2,500. Um, and a lot of the money that is spent was spent by the assembly discretionary last year was going to SFAP and mental health and wellness um, whose budgets increased this year. So we don't really expect that to affect um, the assembly a lot in coming years. Um, and just as, um, for the show cause budget, we didn't make a single change. Um, we left everything the same. That was pretty much what was predicted by um, Tony's spreadsheet, which also helped us a lot. Um, and yeah, so we decided to keep all that the same. 
Um, but yeah, with that, um, we will take any questions. Okay. And I did let the presentation have extended time to see the importance of understanding the budget. I mean, with that, I will now open up the floor for questions. Um, if there is a representative with a question, please raise your hand and I will call on you. All right, Representative Robertson. Noah Robertson, College of Liberal Arts. I was just curious if, um, I know we can do carry a forward or forward amounts from like student fee board. Are we submitting the request to carry forward? Uh, I believe it's like 8% of our, our allocations from them as well. Yeah, so um, I have been in discussion about that, especially um, with Barry, who's our advisor. Um, so that carry forward is actually within the student fee handbook. Um, and that's already that 8%, which is around $11,000 um, is automatically given given to um, the student governments. I believe that there might be some sort of request that we might have to put in um, as the student fee board is getting set up still and, and just notifying that we want that carry forward. But it's my understanding and I can double check on this as well, um, that that's kind of an, an automatic type of thing. Last year, I know that we saw um, we requested it because we saw an increase in the carry forward because we had a lot left over in the budget due to COVID and the, and the transition into COVID. Um, so we actually got around a $13,000 uh, carry forward last year instead of an $11,000 one. Um, but this year it, it'll most likely stick to what's written out in the handbook, which is that 8%. Thank you, Representative Robertson. Are there any other representatives who have questions for Sydney, Aaron, or Tony? If so, please raise your hand. And if not, we will move on. Okay, thank you all so much for your time and explaining the budget to all of us. We will now be moving on to Open Student Forum. Are there any students here for Open Student Forum? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you to unmute you. All right, we will begin with Dan, please state your name and your academic college. You will have two minutes to speak. Okay, um, hello everyone. My name is Dan Risser and I'm from the College of the Liberal Arts. And I just wanted to come um, to come and speak to UPUA tonight, not in my capacity as a chair, but rather a former chair and a current student, um, totally unaffiliated with the UPUA at this point in time. Um, I just really like to support the upcoming policy change tonight. I apologize, my allergies, my allergies are popping off tonight, um, specifically pertaining to the Department of Public Relations um, and, the, and the Department of Outreach and the executive branch. Um, as a former chair transitioning into steering at a very turbulent time for the UPUA last year, um, I found the Department of Outreach extremely difficult to navigate at some points, um, having being forced to make my own graphics for big projects while managing big programming weeks um, with different departments. Um, there were some things that just weren't there for us. Um, and I think um, more than anything, the core of the UPUA's mission and um, the core of my mission when I served on leadership um, was to engage students. And the current infrastructure last year that we had um, did not engage students well enough. And I think with the Department of Public Relations, having people making multimedia presentations, being responsible um, in, that, in that outreach to students, um, which is a continuation of our mission as um, as student representatives, um, I think it would be incredibly more incredibly effective um, in engaging students in our mission, in our work, um, in order to help as many people as possible here at Penn State. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now move to Aphrodite. You please state your name in your academic college and you will have two minutes to speak. Okay, uh, am I audible? Okay, sounds good. Um, hi everyone, Aphrodite um, Biswas. I'm from the College of Engineering and I was also the former executive director of Outreach. And I am here because many of the reps reached out to me regarding the upcoming policy changes that Dan just mentioned. Um, and I just wanna make a few clarifications just so that everyone's on the same page about the conversations that was going on behind the scenes. So first off, I was not um, completely included in the planning of the policy changes. And I did not in any way recommend the creation of the new department of PR. And my quote from the, exec, uh, from the end of your report was um, sort of used out of context, but it has been removed now. So thank you for removing that. Um, but besides that, I know um, Erin and Najee are both very willing to work with me on this if needed. Um, 
But beyond that, I have a few other clarifications and concerns that I want to go through. The first one being that the policy expresses concern about broken communication and collaboration between the Department of Outreach and Communications, which I sort of acknowledge and I know what was going on. But there was essentially no Department of Communication in the 15th Assembly. And all of the work of communications was go going through the Department of Outreach. So I'm honestly not sure where the context for the conclusion is coming from. And that being said, when I say that there was no Department of Communications, what I essentially mean is all the work of Department of Communications was going through um, the Office of Online Outreach, which was an office within the Department of Outreach. So last year, Outreach was essentially working as the Department of Public Relations, as the policy is suggesting. So with this new structural change, I am not entirely sure if it will actually bridge the gap between communications and outreach and the issues that we were facing last year, because the policy change is simply just changing the name of the department and adding two more executive directors in the position to essentially have the same structure that we had last year. So that being said, um, some additional concerns that I have with like this new structure is that it's gonna create a department within a department or like departments within another department, which is a confusing system and almost an absurd precedent to set for the future years. And with the whole thing with executive directors having the powers, but not the position that might just get very confusing. And another concern that I have is many members of the Department of Outreach who are constitutionally permitted to stay in office throughout the next assembly or until they choose, they will get moved around without having been consulted um, earlier. So I do not know how I feel about that because I've worked with these people in the past year. Um, however, I am not completely against the policy change. Something that I see as a very positive fact from this policy change is the idea behind creating a branding guide for UPUA and you know, the multimedia presentations and going more out there with, um, you know, with just technology generally. And that's a communications thing, which I absolutely understand. So my suggestion would be instead of having a new department or like changing names and changing systems, we could simply recruit a UPUA branding manager or a director of some sort under the Department of Outreach as it is right now and have them work under um, the office of either campus relations or online uh, relations just to avoid the whole, um, you know, changes in the cabinet and things like that. Um, finally, I don't want to say anything about voting against or in favor of the change. Um, I personally feel very neutral about it, but I would definitely urge all the representatives to think critically about the proposed changes and to possibly think of more creative and alternative solutions um, in terms of solving the issues that we faced last year. I personally do not think that this new department would address the exact concerns that would present uh, present for in the previous year. So yeah, that's just my two cents about it. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline, please state your name and your academic college. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, my name is Jacqueline Stochel. I'm from the College of Health and Human Development. Um, I'm here to represent Penn State Hillel, um, the largest and most diverse community for Jewish life at Penn State. Um, I want to start by thanking all of you for your hard work, uh, making Jewish students feel supported here, and I really hope we can continue to strengthen our partnership in the future. Um, today, I'm here to advocate for today's agenda item, uh, the resolution against anti-Semitism and in support of the adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition. Uh, this definition, uh, this legislation was actually written by Jewish students empowered to have their voice heard, embraced by the former UPUA president and passed with no opposition at the level of the Justice and Equity Committee. Uh, this powerful piece of legislation calls this assembly to adopt a comprehensive definition of anti-Semitism, one with international consensus and one with Jewish consensus, and if brought to Penn State would serve as an educational tool. We need to be on the same page about what is hurting Jewish students so we can create safer spaces for those Jewish students. Um, now thinking about a Penn State without this definition, here's the reality. Far too many Jewish students have encountered anti-Semitic imagery and stereotyping. 
The distortion and downplaying of history and experiences like Holocaust history is found in our classrooms and dorms. Students are not feeling comfortable being openly proud with their Judaism. Students more and more are hiding their identity and suppressing their celebrations because of the fear they live in. And finally, we all come from different places of perceived threat and trauma management. Uh, we all collectively, though, would fear that the incidence of anti-Semitism will escalate at the university if action is not taken. So we, the Jewish students, believe in this definition and we see a lot of opportunity in adopting it. Upon op adoption, I want Hillel and UPUA to work with this definition so we can educate Penn State students and staff and cultivate a community where individuals recognize and call out anti-Semitic acts when they happen. Uh, this is the work that needs to be done so that Jewish students do feel safer here at Penn State. Um, and that is what I have to say. So thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing your discussion on our resolution. Thank you so much. Are there any other students here for Open Student Forum? If so, please raise your hand. And if not, I will move on. Okay, seeing none, we will now move into a report by President Bose. President Bose, you may begin whenever you're ready. Hi everybody, happy last week of classes. We finally made it. I know it's felt like a long stretch to get here, um, but it's, it's finally here. So good luck on finals as well, if I don't mention that at the end. Um, but thank you to everyone that participated in Denim Day today. Sexual and domestic abuse is never the victim's fault. And thank you for standing in solidarity with the victims. Um, I've been meeting, kind of transitioning now into more of the business side of things. Um, I've been meeting with Speaker Gibbard and Director of Finance McFarland to put together the budget that we presented on earlier. I really wanted to send a major shout out and gratitude to Director McFarland and Acting Deputy Director Jenkins for their in-depth projections and forecasting. It was beyond beneficial um, as we were analyzing the budget. So thank you to you both. Um, the next gen Penn State survey has been reopened until April 30th. I cannot emphasize enough um, how important it is to have student and community voices included in the search for the next university president. So please consider taking it and sharing that information around. Um, the student fee board met last Friday and are gonna meet again this Friday in which we're gonna meet um, to elect the chair and members of the steering committee. Um, Vice President Rodriguez, Chief of Staff Jordan and I met with the newly confirmed executive directors on Sunday morning, which was very exciting. And I'm very passionate and, and um, looking forward to the work that can be done within um, that group of people. Um, I, I and not Vice President Rodriguez and I met with um, Joe Cullen, who's the Chief Investment Officer and Sarah Thorndike, who's the Senior Vice President of Finance um, earlier this afternoon to with other student government executives as well to discuss divestment. Over the summer, we'll be partnering with other student governments to conduct larger scale surveys and educational materials to gain the broader student pulse. Um, thank you so, so much to all of the representatives and students in general that have been engaged in these conversations and research. I'm very hopeful of the progress that, we, that will continue to be made. Um, and I, I hope that we can continue to, to push and work with the university on this. Um, Najee and I have a few meetings with leadership of the Board of Trustees this week and in pre preparation for next week's board cycle. Um, I'm sure that Chair Brown will mention this as well, but the Night of Remembrance is this Thursday. There's both a pre-recorded option um, to attend this as well as an in-person option at 6.30 p.m. in front of Old Main. Um, this basically is a vigil celebrating the lives of any Penn State students that we have lost in the past two years. So please stay tuned for the details, share the graphics that are on our social medias and join in honoring the lives of our fellow students. And lastly, I'm not in State College right now and uh, hopefully I can make it up at some point in the summer, um, but I'd still really love to get to know you all better. So please always feel free to reach out. Um, my number is both in the agenda and on the contact sheets um, and ultimately just good luck on the finals. I'm so very proud of you all and reach out if you need absolutely anything. I'll now stand for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for President Bose? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Seeing none, we will now move on to my report. Um, I will begin, of course, with the land acknowledgement as it isn't solidified um, yet in the governing documents. 
Um, so the University Park Undergraduate Association acknowledges that the Pennsylvania State University campuses are located on the original homelands of the Erie, Honduranase, Lenny Lenape, Shawnee, Susquehannock, and Wazi-Wazi nations. It is important to acknowledge the history of displacement that led to Penn State's establishment. It is crucial for us as the University Park student government to reflect and address the complicated past of exploitation of indigenous peoples by our university so that we remain educated representatives of Penn State. And this of course, as always, is, is credited to the Indigenous People's Student Association. All right, and with that, I will move into my official report. Um, I will be meeting with UHS leadership. I'm in Chair Kohler, I'm in the JND team um, to discuss the logistical planning for the wellness fund for UHS. Um, in the team's um, chat that we have, we've been in discussion with UHS administrators on the best way forward. Um, they've been in discussion with the financial team on how to best address this in terms of the billing to subsidize physicals and prescriptions for students. Um, again, this program is being broader than we would have could have ever imagined. And we're really grateful for Dr. Griffin for his um, efforts into this. Um, and it's basically being opened up to any um, medical need that students may have who are uninsured or who are just underinsured. Um, I made final um, preparations with vice, uh, former Vice President Pathical, um, the Office of the Physical Plant, Borough Leaders and Representatives for Student Affairs to solidify the final purchase of the Every Student Belongs Here banner campaign. Um, the only changes to really mention, of course, in my report, there's the specific um, purchases that will be made, um, again, if the bill does pass assembly. And of course, we have been in discussion about a broader community um, reach as well with the banner campaign. So community members will be included along with students um, to really evolve that. Um, of course, I want you all to be aware of the links that Speaker Gibbard um, sends out in her emails. There's of course, um, the form that allows um, suggestions and just feedback for efficient meeting procedures. Uh, the internal feedback form that you are all allowed to uh, fill out in case you have any current concerns, comments, um, or anything that you feel, feel may need addressing. Um, we also have a form for, of course, improving the efficacy of our meetings by allowing for amendments to be made. Um, I get live updates on those as well as Speaker Gibbard. So if you do have an amendment on legislation, it is highly recommended that you go through that way so we can get the verbatim um, wording of the specific amendment. And of course, I will be hosting the final um, work session for modern rules and assembly operations for this semester um, on this upcoming Sunday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, to assist in just any general questions that you all may have. Um, I realize that this will be our last meeting of the spring semester. And that being said, I just want to congratulate you all and wish you best of luck on the finals. Um, I'll be here in State College over the summer working remotely. So if you do, of course, visit or want to just hang out um, and meet in person, feel free to contact me. Um, my number, of course, is in my official report. Um, and I'm really looking forward um, to what this summer may bring. And with that, I now stand for any questions that you all may have. Are there any questions for me? Seeing none, I'll now move on to the next part of the agenda with liaison and affiliate reports. Um, if you are a liaison or affiliate and have a report, please raise your hand and I will call on you. All right, President Bose, please state your name and the organization that you are reporting from. For the last time ever, Aaron Bose moving on. Um, this Friday at starting at 7 p.m., I believe, um, is moving on's virtual festival. Flo Rida is coming. Please, please, please share the graphics. It's going to be very fun. Um, watch it with your friends, watch it with people that are in your apartment. Um, it, it's just a great end of the year and end of the semester celebration. Um, it's sponsored by your student fee. So technically you paid for it, so you better go. <laughs> um, but it'll be fun. It's a really good um, lineup. There's going to be a student act as well, Floor and Co. Um, which is a great band. So please, please, please make your way out. And it's been great being a moving on liaison. Thank you, President Bose. All right, are there any other liaison or affiliate reports? If so, please raise your hand. And if not, I will move on. All right. Seeing no old business, we will now move into a five minute caucus breakout. I will see you all back here in five minutes. Back into the General Assembly meeting. Um, just a reminder before we get into legislation and 
elections, please be sure to change your pronouns in your name. If you have a longer name like myself, please do so at the end of your first name. And thank you. Um, we will now start up with line item A, election for moving on spring music festival liaison. I'm gonna open up the floor for nominations. Um, please raise your hand if you wish to nominate a representative. Chair Flegel. Chair Flegel at large, I would like to nominate Sean Terry. Thank you, Chair Flegel. Representative Terry, do you accept this nomination? I do accept, thank you. All right, are there any further nominations for this position? Seeing none, Representative Terry, you will have five minutes to speak and 10 minutes for questions. You may begin whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. I'll keep it short because I know tonight's going to be pretty long. Uh, I just want to explain just a little bit why I wanted to take on the moving on liaison position. I've spoken to both Aaron, the previous liaison, and Kara, the part head of facilities. And I just really think that it's something that I would love to be a part of. Um, as you probably all know from the a million times I say it every assembly, I am a big advocate for the arts. Um, and it's something that I'm really passionate about here on campus. Um, I think bringing um, artists to Penn State, especially next year when hopefully we'll be able to be uh, interacting more in person uh, would be a great opportunity, not only for myself, but also for all of Penn Staters uh, across campus to enjoy themselves um, and re really have a great year. Um, I, I know that virtual concerts aren't as much fun, but I still think we can build enthusiasm in the role and, and, and really work to, to create great events um, throughout the, the time there. Obviously, UPA's major uh, sort of thing that they do for moving on is getting the water buggy. Um, I've already, uh, again, talked to Kara. I, I'm, I'm happy to, to help work on that, and I will come to facilities meetings uh, when needed. Um, and again, there's so many great opportunities for artists to come. I'd love to take suggestions for artists. If we want Taylor Swift to come, we're going to get her. If, if we want Pitbull to be there, we're going to get him. You know, we, do, we, want to, we want to figure it out. So if you guys have any suggestions, I'm always free and available um, to talk and I will be an advocate for not only um, our legislators here, but for the greater student body as a whole. So uh, I, I'll yield my time and I'll, I'll take any questions that anybody has. Thank you, Representative Terry. And we will now move into 10 minutes for questions. If a representative has a question, please raise your hand and I will call on your name. Are there any questions for Representative Terry? All right, so seeing no questions, I will now close the floor on questions. Representative Terry, please leave the Zoom call and we will let you know when you are allowed back in. Okay, seeing that Representative Terry has left, we will now move into general discussion, beginning with the nominee table number. We will then move into the actual voting form. Again, it has just been posted. Please go ahead and go to that attendance link and then raise your hand subsequently after once you have submitted your name. Thank you. Again, representatives, um, once you have input, inputted your name into the attendance form, please raise your hand on the Zoom call. Again, the form is on the Teams. Please go ahead and do so. We should have around 38 submissions.
We are going to give it one more minute. Again, representatives, please go ahead and submit your name on the attendance form. Once you have done so, please raise your hand in the Zoom call. All right, we are now going to close the attendance form. Um, thank you all for promptly filling that out. We will now move into the actual voting link. And if you have not filled out the attendance form, please do not fill out this form for the actual vote itself. Again, the vote has been posted, so please refer to that and make your vote for Representative Terry as the moving on liaison. Once you have done so, please go ahead and lower your hand. Thank you all. I will now allow the candidate back into the room. Congratulations, Representative Terry. You have been elected the liaison for moving on with a vote of 34, zero to zero. Thanks guys, appreciate it. We will now start with line item B, confirmation of justices to the judicial board. Jacob, Taryn, uh, Amelia, and David, will you all please raise your hands? All right, thank you all. You will have five minutes to introduce yourselves and any, um, any details you might have on your new appointment. And then you'll have 10 minutes for questions subsequently after. Um, we can begin with uh, Jacob and then Taryn and Amelia and David. And you may begin whenever you are ready. So I'm gonna keep this pretty short. Hi, my name is Jake Lemler. Um, I am a, gonna be a rising junior in the College of Liberal Arts. This is going to be my third this would be, if uh, elected, would be my third term on the judicial board. I would love to serve the judicial board again, as I have for the past two years under multiple different um, presidents and multiple different um, types and agencies. Um, I'm going to mostly just leave it open to questions if anyone has any questions for me. Um, because I've served so long, I believe my record does speak for itself. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask me anything you might need to know. Okay, you want me to go? You're all good. Okay, awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Taryn, I'm a sophomore. This would be my second year in the J Board. I joined last year under uh, Chief Justice Shookman and President McKay. Um, I really enjoyed being on the board for the last year. Uh, we did, I think, a lot of cool things that the J Board hadn't done before. Uh, some of them weren't great, some of them were good. And because of that, I think we've kind of gotten a feel of how we wanna set bylaws and kind of improve the J Board over the next year. Um, I know Jordan has been big on that, and it's something I'd like to work with him and the rest of the justices on over the next year. So uh, yeah, um, I've really enjoyed working on the JPR last year, and I'd like to do it again. So thanks. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Amelia Dodu. I am a rising junior, and I'm studying psychology and African studies. This, if confirmed, this would be my second year um, on the judicial board, and I'm really excited to serve um, on the judicial board. Um, the previous year, we did do a lot of interesting things, as Taron mentioned earlier, and I'm really passionate about creating a diverse and more acceptable space here at Penn State, and I think my position here on the judicial board like allows me to do so. So if confirmed, I would love to get to work.
All right, I'll go last then. Um, hello, everybody. My name is David Poole. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, I am a junior studying finance international politics. And uh, if reconfirmed, this would be my second term on the judicial board. And I'll stay with my other judicial board members and keep my introduction short. Thanks. Thank you all. We will now move into a 10 question period for any questions. Um, that will be 10 minutes. Are there any questions for either of the nominees? All right, Representative Lascalzo. Ryan Lascalzo, Lion Pride representative. Um, the judicial board primarily does like three-ish things, stuff with community groups, stuff with elections, and then stuff with like internal conflicts slash, slash like removal of people. Uh, in the past, not all of these things have been as effective as they uh, could be. What would each of you try to do to improve those three? And anyone can feel free to answer, whether that be in order or whether you just have an answer to that specific question. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll go first and keep this pretty brief. Um, when talking about effectiveness, we as a judicial board, at least talking at least talking with the other members who have served in the past and the ones who are currently here we are not meant to be a legislative body we aren't meant to intervene in places where um it is not either in the documents where we should intervene or in the doc or where we're asked to intervene um so in terms of effectiveness we only are able to really be as effective as the current assembly or the current members really want us to be and i think in the past two years we have been effective when we have been asked to be, when we've been asked to uh, intervene, when we've been asked to decide on various questions. However, I do want to reiterate that going forward, I don't believe we should overstep what we should be doing and try to create policy or create um, issues in uh, different things that go on during the assembly. So in terms of effectiveness, there are ways we could be more effective when asked to be, uh, namely maybe bringing up timelines a little bit, maybe having opening opening sessions a little bit more up to the public. But in terms of what we can do and what we have done in the past, in terms of uh, making it more effective in so far as intervening may not be the best idea for the judicial board. Yeah, I can just add to that really quickly. I think Jake is right. I mean, we're obviously constrained by like the bylaws and by the constitution. Um, and we don't really have the power to change a lot of those like rules or anything. Um, but internally, when these issues do arise, like the hearing we had where you were the, it was the first hearing we ever did as a J board and you were one of the parties. Um, I think we learned kind of how can we make uh, a set of bylaws that standardizes how we do hearings in the future uh, because we had that first trial run. Um, so I think internally when it comes to like hearings and to how we do community group seats and all that stuff, there are some ways that we can set bylaws and internal procedures um, but beyond that, I think there's not a lot we can really do for effectiveness that doesn't involve, you know, legislating it through the, uh, through the assembly. But yeah. Just to add a bit on that, I, I completely agree with um, Jacob and Tehran. Um, in terms of effectiveness, I think it all comes down to the conversations that we're able to have internally within the judicial board and then what we're able to communicate and take on to the legislative branch. And I think the only way we can continue to do so is by being by trying to work as one team because we are the student government of the Pennsylvania State University and I think that if we continue to work well together um, like our job will be done effectively. Yeah, I'll just add on to that really quickly. Um, I think that this last year we definitely got more efficient in adding some processes that helped us move through something like a hearing something like a uh, you know, resolving disputes and stuff like that. So I think that going forward, it's just kind of continuing what we're doing. And um, yeah, just kind of, it depends on what the legislative branch and how much they involve us in, in stuff like policy and stuff like that. Thank you. Are there any further questions for the nominees to the judicial board? If so, please raise your hand. Representative Zhang. Yeah, um, Stephen Zhang at large. Thank you guys for uh, reapplying for these positions. And I really do love the passion that you all show and your uh, 
devotion to justice within the EPUA. Um, what would you say are some experiences that drove you to reapply for your positions or apply for your positions? Um, and where do you hope this experience will enrich uh, your understanding of justice, you know, whether it's within UPUA, within Penn State, or, you know, in your general life? So I'll, I'll just start briefly. I think my biggest um, thing was back in my freshman year, um, I'm not sure anyone here, else here really remembers it. I'm, probably some of you do. Um, there was an issue between the current Chief Justice and a member of uh, the representative. Uh, member of an at-large representative. And I just remember uh, watching uh, Chief Justice Shookman um, in that kind of conflict, but making sure and seeing how she remained impartial. Um, she remained not willing to uh, stoop down to any low standards, how she remained dedicated to the issues of justice, equity, and fair treatment at Penn State, um, even though she, in my belief, was being unfairly treated at that point. Um, so again, a long time ago, but I, seeing that, that just made me want to continue that legacy of fairness and equity on the judicial board and um, be a member of the judicial board as many years as I could as an undergraduate student at Penn State. Um, I also think going forward, seeing the different issues that we've seen on the judicial board has given me a more broad perspective of justice and equity in a terms of a diverse student body that I didn't have when I look at what I had back home, maybe in high school or even just coming into college. So that's why I have enjoyed and hope to continue to enjoy this experience of being on the judicial board. I think um, I'll go next. Um, just to brush on a bit of my um, goals in the future. So I'm really passionate about going to law school and being on the judicial board has really given me the opportunity to um, examine and look at things that a lot of attorneys and judges and people who like are inherently involved with the legislative system and branches in our society deal with even though it's not like the exact replica um, one thing that being on the judicial board has allowed me to do especially is um, see what's involved in our community and try and approach things very um, honestly but without bias and partial and still being fair and ensuring that there's equity in everything around us and i think that's something i'm really passionate about especially being one of the only minority students on the judicial board i feel as though it gives us the opportunity for a voice to be heard at state at penn state yeah basically the same as what Melia said um i think you know i i want to go to law school i want to work in civil liberties and in protection of you know rights against like abuse of policing and, and sorts of violations of basic rights of people in everyday life. Um, and so I, I think obviously we're not dealing with as heavy questions when we're in the Jade Board, but we're still dealing with, you know, interpretation of text, something that you need to do um, if you're ever going to be a lawyer. And I think that's A, really interesting to me and fun. It seems weird, but I enjoy like dealing with all the intricacies of like the UPA constitution and kind of the weird stuff. There are some like, con like contradictory segments and things that we had to work over over the last year. And so it's been fun to kind of go through and write the opinions and like reason stuff there. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's important to have like a diverse board and to promote diversity um, through that for the rest of the organization and for how we present ourselves to the entire student body. Um, and I've really enjoyed, do I've enjoyed doing that over the last year. I'd like to do more of it over the next year, um, and especially when it comes to the elections commission and give, like, bring in more diverse candidates um, and make sure everyone has like, the, uh, can like access the information sessions and all the things that we do. Um, so yeah, those are all kind of the things that got me interested in J board and want me to keep working on over the next year. Yeah, I'll just go off really quickly what everybody else said. So for me personally, like I got involved in J board because I wanted to see more equity within the organization, you know, working um, personally within like the leadership of LGBT organizations had really led me to want to continue working in the judicial board. And not only that, but like Taryn said, like the interpretation of text and stuff like that is, is something that's really interesting to me. So I think going forward is kind of ensuring equity within not only the judicial board, but the UPA as a whole, as well as like, you know, working on our constitutional difficulties and stuff like that. Thank you all. And we do have about two minutes left. Are there any final questions for these nominees? And of course, while we wait that, um, nominees, if you'll please reference the chat, that is the group me that I will ask you to join um, for discussion period. That's how I will communicate with you to let you back into the room. So please be sure to join that if you have not done so already.
Are there any other questions for the nominees? Okay, seeing none, I will now close the floor to questions. And seeing that all nominees have joined the group meet, I will ask you all to leave the Zoom call and I will let you know when you will be allowed back in. Thank you. And we will now move into an explanation of the nomination by President Bose. Hello, um, so just so everyone is aware, um, this is a presidential appointment. However, seeing as it falls underneath the judicial branch, I did rely heavily on um, Chief Justice Zaya's experience with these candidates as well as his opinion in making these decisions. So I'll actually be reading out his um, reasonings for nominations of these four candidates and I'll go in order of um, their speeches as well. So for Jacob, Jacob brings the needed experience to the board as the only member still remaining from the 14th assembly. His knowledge of the governing documents along with his determination and engagement to help the board run makes him a great justice and I know he will continue to bring that this year. For Taryn, Taryn has been a pleasure to work with on the board. They're always bringing new insights and contributing greatly to discussions while assisting with writing the decisions. They have a very strong commitment to the board and great knowledge of the governing documents. I know they will be an awesome justice for this assembly. Amelia, Amelia has been a very active member on the judicial board this year, working with her in both mock trial and UPA. I've seen her firsthand, I've seen firsthand her dedication and her work ethic to ensure fairness and equity on the board. I know that she will be a great justice again for this assembly. And for David, David is a great leader and has been a great justice on the board this past year. He has always been involved in the discussions and was a huge help during the election se season. I know that his dedication to fairness and equity, equity will continue to shrine as a justice for the 16th. Um, so those are Chief Justice Zaya's um, reasonings for nominations. And as I mentioned before, I completely stand with, with him and, and his um, nominations as well and, and take them as my own too. So I will now stand for questions. Are there any questions for President Bose? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Seeing none, I will now close the floor. Jason Nelson. Here. Janelle Luazo. Here. Jordan Diebler. Here. George Durango Espin. Here. Joshua Reynolds. Here. Caitlin Farrar. Here. Kyle Quinn. Here. Lakin Meter. Here. Lewis Richardson. Here. Marie Missner. Here. Marie Gillespie. Here. Matthew DeAngelis. Here. Megan Neely. Here. Michael DeBoten. Michael Jablonski. Present. Noah Robertson. Here. Patricia Burungi. Here. Raina Alexander. Here. Refugio Lara. Here. Ryan Lascalzo. Here. Samantha Brown. Here. Samuel Jaw. Here. Sean Terry. Selena Go. Here. Seth Constine. Here. Uh, Steven Zhang. Here. Sydney Gibbard. Here. Was anyone's name? We're not? going. Yes, like sec like Secretary Campos said, is there anyone's name who hasn't been called? Representative Terry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Secretary Campos, we're gonna cross-reference. We should have 38 active voting members for the policy changes. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you all for 
bearing with us on that. Um, just for context for new representatives, as we vote and move into policy, it will be vote uh, votes by roll call. So we will call your names um, and you'll vote either yes, no, or abstain um, for the policy, which is why we need an accurate count because there needs to be a certain amount of voting representatives um, for specific uh, changes, whether it be constitutional or bylaws. Um, and we'll go more into that if we do have issues, but I don't think that we will. Um, so that being said, we will now move into line item D, policy 0116, creation of the Department for Public Relations. Speaker Gibbard, will you please introduce this? Yes, so I'm gonna share my screen to pull up the actual policy itself, um, even though I've sent it before, um, but just so you guys see it um, on hand. Um, but yeah, hi everyone. Um, so basically um, this is policy 116, which is the creation of the Department for Public Relations. Um, we presented on this last week and basically what we are doing is we are um, moving the outreach and communication departments and making them offices underneath of the um, overarching Department for Public Relations. Um, basically, we copied and pasted the charges for each of these departments, so they will have the same charges um, and the same type of structure and will have the same type of authority on different matters within the UPA. Um, there's also, um, I know in the first policy that we sent out, we had originally called them departments, but it was raised as a concern that there will be potential like confusion having departments underneath the department, so we changed that name to the office in steering um, and we are presenting that amendment to you guys so that you're all aware of it. Um, it didn't necessarily change the nature of the legislation. We just wanted to be clear about um, a change that we had made in steering. Um, and so other than that, another change that we made is we changed the nature of the situation so that it focused just more on the goals of the Bose Rodriguez administration and um, reflecting their vision within um, the Department for Public Relations. The goal and the overarching goal of this is basically to um, streamline communication within between these two groups and bring them closer together underneath a unified executive director so that tasks are being delegated properly. Um, it also doesn't remove any powers or um, any ability that the director of communications and the director of outreach will have. Um, you can see here that it says that this director will be granted the same responsibilities and rights of executive directors, which allows them to be in on meetings with the president and vice president and have that communication study so that it's not just um, on the executive director of public relations. Um, we wanted, we felt that that was extremely important to include because it also allows um, these directors the right to appoint um, different positions underneath themselves. So that includes um, if they want someone to do within communications, um, someone to focus on social media, they have the ability to appoint someone to that position. Um, and it doesn't need to be a constitutional amendment or anything like that. Um, all the executive directors and the director of communication and the director of outreach will have the same powers. Um, I also was just gonna address a few questions that I know that we've had a lot of people ask us about. Um, so uh, I know that um, some people were concerned that these offices won't help communication, um, but we really truly believe that both outreach and communication play distinct roles within the UPA. Um, communication really focuses on internal aspects of the UPA, whereas outreach really focuses on external aspects of the UPA. And, um, we really wanna distinguish these roles from each other. And that's kind of the purpose of the executive director of public relations um, by separating different tasks and delegating them to the different offices so that communications and outreach can um, still feel like they're both contributing to the success of UPA as a whole. Um, other than that, um, I will yield the rest of my time to President Bose if she has anything else to add or Vice President Rodriguez, um, either one of you. I know we presented on this last week and they both were there for that presentation, um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. I believe um, like Speaker Gibber did a really great job going over everything. Um, I just really wanna emphasize the fact that as an advocacy organization, communication and outreach are almost exclusively the most important things that we do. Um, when it comes to being able to assess student needs in, in the form of not only being able to reach out and, and communicate what we're doing as an organization, but also being able to have that awareness and accessibility for students on campus of what UQA is um, so that students can come to us and, and know really what, um, and we can help advocate and, and, and carry out their student needs at the highest level. Um, and so I believe that that by breaking it up into communications and outreach, but keeping it into that, that one department of public relations 
will not only help um, distribute some of the work, but also make it easier as a legislative body that, that when you guys are working on initiatives to really pinpoint and access directly um, the specific people that you need to carry out and execute the rest of your tasks within the initiatives. Um, also, it would just help with organizing and, and making sure that everyone has that same amount and, and, and the um, holistic ability to have the same amount of information on everything as possible. Um, I will state this is kind of preliminary, um, but we're looking to have a director of communications and, and our, our, we're putting out a, a job posting currently is what I, I mean to say, um, that will be able to oversee all of this and, and really be able to make sure that our communications is really the most important essential thing that we're doing when we're pushing out these, these initiatives and also gaining interest of student needs and gaining just overall accessibility of the UPUA. Um, and Vice President Rodriguez, if you have anything to add as well. Yeah, I would just state um, from, again, this was um, kind of conceived from personal experiences, like as a chair last year, um, just ensuring that there, again, is that overarching structure that would allow and supplement both offices to work together, but also allow for easier directives to be issued and ensure that there are two distinct missions, for example, outreach being external outreach to specific groups, whereas communications is really serving the needs of the representatives in the chairs um, in regards to initiatives, in regards to programming. Um, it's probably one of the most important facets of our operations within the executive, um, kind of due to just the, out, the communications and public relations that we need to establish um, within the university community with students, because again, that is how we get the word out. Um, and this is just us um, really trying to exercise just our prerogative to kind of um, shape kind of our executive branch as we see fit within our administration to really better the efficiency um, of communications and outreach under the idea of public relations. And that is all that I would add to that. Um, that being said, we will now move into any questions for Speaker Gibbard. Um, please raise your hand if you do have a question um, and I will call on you. Are there any questions for Speaker Gibbard regarding this policy? Seeing, all right, uh, Representative Nelson. Hi, Jason Nelson, Lion Pride. Uh, I wanted to get uh, Speaker Gibber's opinion on the idea posed by uh, Miss Aphrodite, I believe it's pronounced uh, Biswas, uh, talking about creating a manager of a uh, style guide for the UPUA. Yeah, so thank you so much for that question. I think that that's a really, really, really great idea. Um, I think that it's not something that needs to be necessarily included within the constitution. And I think that um, it's not necessarily precedent within the UPA to actually add positions within departments or offices within the constitution, um, which really allows the kind of creative license and the authority of the director of that officer department to appoint positions as they please. Um, and I think that the director of outreach or director of communications, whoever decides that that position fits in their office best um, is definitely, it would definitely be a really great addition to the EPA um, and having them with those specific charges that former um, executive director of outreach Biswas mentioned in Open Student Forum. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Are there any further questions for Speaker Gibbard? All right. Seeing none, I'm now closing the floor for questions directed to Speaker Gibbard, and we will now move into discussion. Is there any discussion on the policy? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Representative Lascalzo. Uh, Ryan Lascalzo, line pride representative. I have a uh, minor amendment that I sent in through the amendment form. If you scroll up to the top, uh, it's for the last line in the first paragraph of the, thank you Najee for posting it in the chat, in the um, uh, nature of the situation. Uh, essentially, the last line is like, while these groups you know, accomplished their separate goals, there was a lack of efficiency between the groups and the roles often overlapped. I wanna change that to while these separate entities accomplished their stated goals, their, their roles often overlapped. Essentially, I just want to, we don't want to like, uh, place blame on people if that's like, I wanna make sure that we are not telling the people that used to be in the role that they were inefficient with their job. And I think this is just a nicer way to get across the same point. And I just wanna make sure that we aren't accidentally insulting any of our friends with this piece of legislation. 
Is there a second for that motion? Okay. Seeing and I am a accepted as friendly. And it is accepted as friendly. Thank you, Speaker Gibbard. All right, is there any further discussion on the policy at hand? Representative Nelson. Hi, I had two amendments that I would like to add. Uh, the first one is a proposed friendly amendment talking about uh, a typo under the, uh, where was it now? Uh, it was under on line 50, I believe, where it goes part D, part D, then part E. So I wanted to propose the friendly amendment to fix that to part E, then F. Uh, which Najee has uh, posted in chat. Thank you, uh, Vice President Najee. And then the uh, the second amendment I wanted to propose was that I feel the creation of a style guide is something that's highly important and should be enforced through the constitution since there's been a large discrepancy in the ways that uh, UPA official materials have been branded across the across our various social media and distributed platforms. As such, it should be essential that we create a style guide. And I was hoping this policy would lead to the creation of that, but there isn't any explicit language. I would like to create language in order to ensure that there is a UPA style guide and that that style guide will be maintained through the office, uh, no matter what the direct no matter what director may take up that position. And so as such, I am proposing the amendment, which uh, Vice, this Vice President Najee is posted in chat. Thank you. Is there a second to that amendment? Okay, so there is a second to that amendment. What I will um, interject and say as my power is chair and within the gu guidelines of the bylaws and constitution, um, both documents are vague for a reason. Um, and I would very much recommend straying away from specific um, charges um, that might complicate or might be accidentally invalidated. Um, this a style guide manager, of course, would require us to reach out to a student that would be proficient in this. Um, and there might be difficulty in attaining that, especially since it would be a, a constitutional charge that would be given. So again, Okay, so the second has been rescinded. Um, okay. Am I allowed to also give maybe discussion on it or? I'll allow it, yes. Um, just for the general context um, to Representative Nelson. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to say, um, I agree with what um, Vice President Rodriguez said um, as far as like adding it to the constitution itself. But I think that maybe there would be room for it somewhere in like the nature of the situation or recommended course of action um, saying that like, this is an example of a position that we suggest, but I do hesitate on like the legislative body charging the executive branch with like what positions that they can include um, and like they see fit and what they see best for the department. Um, I completely agree that this is like totally necessary and I heard a necessity for it throughout the meeting today. I just think that I like wanna, wanna hesitate as far as including it within the actual constitution. But um, if maybe you amend your, your or resubmit a new amendment that would be more appropriate for the recommended course of action or nature of the situation, then I think that it would be like more appropriate there. And since we are in discussion, Representative Nelson, um, is that something that you'd like to consider? Uh, yes, I think that's a, that's a good compromise. So, okay, so would you like me to submit the, uh, the amendment proposal form again, or can we just do that on the floor now? That is fine. I, we just need the line item for where that can be placed, um, and that can be a formal amendment. Um, and if you are making that formal amendment, we just need a second. All right. So. Okay, so I suppose we'll put it at the end, and then uh, we'll reword it to say that Let me go ahead and reword it real quick. I just sent a, a reworded version through the amendment form. Oh. Uh, that would be good. Thank you, Representative Lascalzo. I will go ahead and paste that into the chat for all representatives to see. <clears throat> and Representative Gibbard, as that is posted, do you accept that as friendly? Uh, yes. 
I can't copy and paste from the chat, but I will add that at the end of the recommended course of action. Is that where um, Representative Lascalza would like to see it and Representative Nelson? So line item 24, is that sufficient? Yeah, uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay, thank you all. And with that, that has now been officially added. Is there any further discussion on the policy? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing no further discussion, I will now close the floor on discussion. And we will now move, I'm sorry, we will now move into a vote by roll call. Secretary Campos. Um, okay. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. We just exited out of the document. <laughs> okay. Um, Arthi Kalor. Yes. No, Alia Federoff. Yes. Anne Marie Round Sorensen. Uh, yes. Brandon Walker. Yes. Kara Flygel. Yes. Carter Gangle. Yes. Kathy Zhao. Yes. David Morgan. Yes. Donald Impavito. Yes. Emmanuel Monte. Yes. Hope Steger. Yes. Holden Ingalls. Jasmine Baldick. Yes. Jason Nelson. Yes. Janelle Oazo. Yes. Jordan Diebler. Yes. George Durango Espen. Yes. Joshua Reynolds. Yes. Caitlin Farrar. Yes. Kyle Quinn. Yes. Lakin Meter. Yes. Lewis Richardson. Yes. Marie Missner. Yes. Marissa Gillespie. Yes. Matthew DeAngelis. Yes. Megan Neely. Yes. Michael DeBoten. Michael Jablonski. Yes. Noah Robertson. Yes. Patricia Burungi. Yes. Raina Alexander. Yes. Refugio Lara. Yes. Ryan Lascalzo. Yes. Samantha Brown. Yes. Samuel Aja. Yes. Sean Terry. Yes. Selena Go. Yes. Seth Constein. Yes. Steven Zhang. Y yes. Sydney Gibbard. Yes. And please hold as Secretary Campos and I count the vote. All right, policy 0116, creation of the Department of for Public Relations passes with unanimous vote of 38 zero to zero. We will now move into line item E, policy 0216, creation of the Department of Committee Relations. Speaker Gibbard, will you please introduce this? 
Yes. Um, hello, everyone. So this is part two to the um, executive branch changes that we presented at last meeting. Um, basically, what we will be doing is creating um, this one is a full creation of department of called um, the committee relations. Um, and so basically, what will be happening is we'll be creating a director that is assigned to each committee. So there will be an executive director of student life, director of justice and equity, and every single committee. And basically, that person will be charged with doing more of the logistical um, carrying out the initiatives that have been passed by the legislative body as far as um, either booking rooms, um, helping with tabling, overseeing, and making sure that once we pass something as a bill, the supplies are ordered for programming. Um, I personally, within the legislative branch, see a huge need for this um, as I was super involved with like SFAP week last um, this past semester, and it was really hard to manage um, making sure that all the materials were ordered and that all the tabling was set up. And so that's kind of what the um, executive side of these committees will be doing. Um, and so um, each of these directors um, within the committee of relation of uh, committee relations department will be allowed to appoint their own directors. So um, I know that there was a lot of conversation about where are these um, director of sexual misconduct and director of mental health and wellness, where are those directors going? Um, so those directors are really just being brought closer to the legislative side so that they can work more closely with the people that are actually carrying out initiatives and passing legislation so that they can make sure that they have a unified um, goal and mission for the year. Um, I worked very closely with the director of sexual misconduct, Aaron Brown, last year um, for Sexual Violence Awareness and Prevention Week. And um, we, I personally saw a really big need for this, for us to bring those two, um, the executive and legislative sides together. And so this is really what the Department of Community Relations is going to do. Um, basically, we will be adding things to the constitution um, and there's, um, it, this change to the bylaws is not really necessarily related to the Department of Community Relations, so I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but like I said um, in the last legislation, um, all of these executive boards of each of the committees will be led by directors who have the same responsibilities and rights as they do of executive directors. So they will be required to um, meet with the president and vice president. Um, and their main person that they will be reporting to will be um, Chief of Staff Jordan um, to ensure that there's really strong communication between the legislative and executive branch, which I know of a lot of the people in both branches saw a huge need for um, in the 15th assembly. Um, and I know that there were a couple different questions that I just have written down that I know I wanted to address when I was presenting this. Um, there was a concern about the Office of Assembly Relations, which was within the president's um, office in the 15th assembly. So that office is actually not in the constitution anywhere. It's only on the website. Um, and also I don't believe um, to my knowledge that there was anyone appointed to this office. Um, so I think that the committee relations will completely take on whatever role um, the Office of Assembly Relations had in the 15th Assembly, and it will um, also grow out that role and work more closely with the legislative branch. Um, Another thing is that a lot of people were wondering, what are these people doing, um, like the directors of these committees doing that reps can't do themselves? Um, and I think that there's gonna be a lot more programming next year once we move back in person. And a lot of people haven't um, actually seen that programming because they've only been a part of UQA while it's virtual. Um, but they're, programming is a lot of logistics and a lot of on the ground work and we can really use the help from the executive branch to focus on these programming weeks and make sure that they're carried out to their extent. Um, also, people were worried about getting rid of those specialized directors. I kind of touched on that a little bit um, already, but those specialized directors still exist. They will just be brought closer to a committee by being assigned to a specific committee. Um, that doesn't prevent collaboration with other committees. It just strengthens their relationship with the with their counterpart within the legislative branch. Um, uh, some people were also bringing up concerns about getting rid of the Department of Rights and Equity, um, but the um, Justice and Equity Director will really assume that role within the um, executive branch now underneath the Department for Committee Relations. Um, and I think that I answered all those questions that I have written down, um, but I will yield the rest of my time if I have any um, to President Bose and Vice President Rodriguez. Um, and answer any questions you have afterwards. Again, Speaker Gibber did a great job overviewing everything and, and addressing a lot of the concerns that we've heard. Um, I just wanna emphasize again, that our main goal is to increase that efficiency, collaboration and communication between all of the branches and the organization as a whole. 
Um, I think that the most amount of collaboration and communication that we can have established within our structures, um, just the more that we are able to do and, and the more that we're really able to um, kind of expand our, our initiatives and our advocacy. Um, I think if you're looking for more of a simplistic value-based value, value -based way to look at these changes, um, it's really more so that these executive um, boards and, and the directors that fall underneath these executive boards, they're gonna be taking on a lot of the action side of the initiatives that we're doing. So whether that be um, getting to the graphics, putting together a lot of, um, like being able to be there right from the start of these initiatives and right from the start of these programs, um, right into the end and seeing exactly how they've been developed and how they've changed um, throughout the, the process of making an initiative and be able to effectively communicate to the executive branch and also within um, their own development of the vision because they are student experts at the end of the day in these rooms that are able to add to that vision. Um, being able to have the executive branch and the legislative branch in the same room from the beginning um, so that everyone's fully informed and is able to have um, the best amount of communication because we are a large organization and we're making and when we're making sure to um, really bolster our advocacy to the best ability we want to make sure that um, within the organization we're all informed on what's going on and are able to um, perform our different roles to the best of our abilities um, and if there's any time left vice president rodriguez i'll yield it to you if not questions so that was pretty comprehensive and we are indeed out of time. So we will now be opening up the floor to any questions directed to Speaker Gibbard. If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Again, if you do have a question for Speaker Gibbard, please raise your hand. Representative DeAngelis. Representative DeAngelis at large. So basically, this is just more so for clarification. The new positions that are being um, proposed would just streamline um, everything so that the actual representatives aren't focusing most of their time on um, ordering supplies and like other things and um, are more so just focused on the actual initiative getting done and completed. And it doesn't really create uh, more bureaucracy, but just streamlines pro processes and actually um, makes things easier on the representative side so that the workload is um, essentially reduced. Yeah, so um, how I kind of think of it is that the legislative side is focused on action and advocacy, and then the executive side is really um, focused on carrying out the um, action that the legislative would like to see and also assisting them and um, just carrying out those logistical side of things that you kind of mentioned in your question there. Um, but from how the way you posed your question to me, like, yes, you have the correct understanding of um, how this policy will be implemented. Thank you, Representative DeAngelis. Representative Terry. Sean Terry at large. I, I just had a quick question because I know committee coordinators were a thing for a little bit. So are, is this going to be a similar sort of advisory role, like a sort of an addition, additional help to the legislative branch? Uh, and to the legislative committees to, to sort of aid them in projects? Or is this really a position where they're taking full control of like implementing these sort of initiatives that the legislation wants to have happen and they're just like letting the executive take over? Because I know that there's been some concern about like if the executive branch, like if there's no like, if the legislative branch has no control over the actual like inaction of the policy. But, but again, this is just, I, I don't know. I just wanted to get clarification on the difference between those committee coordinators in this. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so you can see kind of in the policy here that we actually crossed out the term committee coordinators. Um, basically, these directors will be assuming the role of the committee coordinators that were in um, the 15th assembly. Um, actually, just for reference, also in the 14th assembly, and I don't know how many assemblies before that, but um, there were these directors and in the 15th, they were changed to the title of the committee coordinators. Um, what we're doing in the 16th assembly now is reinstating those directors to assume the role of those committee coordinators, but um, we are establishing a department that houses them as well. Um, and that department will be collaborating with the chief of staff and other members of the executive branch instead of just having like one appointee to each committee that does, isn't necessarily part of like a larger department. Um, and I think that the second part of your question is maybe about um, uh, 
like executive overreach kind of and like the legislative maybe not having as much control into the implementation of different um, legislation. Um, the legislative still has the ability to see that out. I just think that it can typically be seen more of a burden um, and like interference with advocacy. Um, and so like that's why the executive branch will be there to assist and work on those things with the legislative branch. Um, but I saw in the chat that um, President Bose had another answer as well. Yeah, I, just, just to add on to Speaker Gibbard's point as well, I think last year, and, and a lot of you in this room are actually committee coordinators yourselves as well, so you can, you can speak to this too. Um, but last year, committee coordinators were having the tasks that we're basically giving to these directors now of trying to figure out who's in the executive branch. Um, but the problem is the committee coordinators were underneath of the legislative branch and didn't have that direct contact with the executive branch. So there'll be weekly meetings within the executive branch hosted by Chief, Je or Chief of Staff um, Jordan in which the ability of these directors of, this, of the committees can directly interact with the other executive departments and have that already established connection um, and ability to speak to the Department of Communications and Department of Records to have that more streamlined conversation um, that's more built into the structure rather than having to do it and, and figure it out on your own, which can be a little bit overwhelming. Representative Steger. Hi, I was just wondering if you could kind of um, elaborate on how these people are going to be kind of, I guess, appointed or if they're going to be appointed and will they be voted on by the legislative body? And also like how, like, if they're being appointed, are they being appointed by the executive branch or are they being appointed by um, the, what's the word that I'm looking for, chairs of the committees? And if they're being appointed by the chairs of the committees, like are we each, is each individual chair supposed to reach out to people? Will there be like a streamlined process of where people can apply to different committees and so on and so forth, just to kind of understand the process a little bit better? Yeah, so I can answer that question. I'm sure that President Bose might wanna add something to that as well. Um, we did talk about this in steering a little bit um, because it will be a presidential appointment, but um, President Bose expressed that she will be taking each of the chairs of the respective committee that that um, director is applying for into like the utmost consideration. And that will be the highest, um, I guess, priority and concern that she is hearing um, when we conduct those interviews and steering. Um, I also believe that they will be brought to the floor um, because they have the same rights and responsibilities as an executive director. So they will be brought to the floor for um, assembly confirmation as well. Um, and other than that, I think I answered all of your question, but let me know if I put missed part to that as well. Representative Steger, did that answer that or did you require further clarification? That works, thank you. Are there any further questions for Speaker Gibbard? Seeing no further questions, I will now close the floor for questions directed to Speaker Gibbard. We will now move into discussion on the policy. If there is any discussion, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Representative Lascalzo. Uh, Ryan Lascalzo, Lion Pride representative. Um, I actually have a amendment to make that I have sent. Yes. Uh, essentially, this just kind of changes up the wording a little bit. Uh, in the constitution itself, it doesn't define what a executive board of a committee is. It's kind of confusingly worded in a sense that um, in the past, I sometimes the executive branch was called the executive board. And I just know sometime in the future, someone's gonna like control and replace a whole bunch of stuff when they're editing the documents is gonna cause a lot of issues in the future. It's kind of to future proof it. Um, departmental staff is a thing that's defined in the constitution as staff that is a part of an executive department that kind of assists with doing things. So I just replaced the words executive board with departmental staff, as well as there's small uh, grammatical changes things a little bit, just a little bit of grammatical changes to make everything flow easier and make sense. Do you accept this as friendly, Speaker Gibbard? And is there? Yes, I know we talked about this, Ryan, as well. So yes, I accept this as friendly. Okay, the amendment has been accepted as friendly, meaning it will be added to the official wording of the policy. Is there any further discussion on the policy? If so, please raise your hand.
Seeing no further discussion, I will now close the floor for discussion and we will now move into a vote by roll call over the policy. Secretary Campos, you may begin whenever you're ready. Arthi Kalor. Yes. Aliyah Federoff. Yes. Anne Marie Round Sorensen. Yes. Brandon Walker. Yeah. Kara Flegel. Yes. Carter Gangle. Yes. Kathy Zhao. Yes. David Morgan. Yes. Donald Impavito. Yes. Emmanuel Monte. Yes. Hope Steger. Yes. Holden Ingalls. Jasmine Bolduck. Yes. Jason Nelson. Yes. Janelle Loazzo. Yes. Jordan Diebler. Yes. George Durango Espin. Yes. Joshua Reynolds. Yes. Caitlin Farrar. Yes. Kyle Quinn. Lakin Meter. Yes. Lewis Richardson. Yes. Marie Missiner. Yes. Marissa Gillespie. Yes. Matthew DeAngelis. Yes. Megan Neely. Yes. Michael DeBoten. Michael Jablonski. Yes. Noah Robertson. Yes. Patricia Burungi. Yes. Raina Alexander. Yes. Refugio Lara. Ryan Lascalzo. Yes. Samantha Brown. Yes. Samuel Ja. Yes. Sean Terry. Yes. Selena Go. Yes. Seth Constein. Yes. Steven Zhang. Yes. Sydney Gibbard. Yes. All right. Please hold um, as we go ahead and cross reference the count. Thank you all for your patience. Thank you all. Policy 0216, creation of the Department of Committee Relations passes unanim unanimously with a vote of 36 zero to zero. We will now move, in, move into line item F, policy 0316, addition of a land acknowledgement to the meeting agenda. Chair Kuller and Chair Flegel, will you please introduce this policy? Hello, everyone. Um, so to start off, let me open my report really quickly. Um, so the policy 0316, the addition of land acknowledgement to meeting agenda, um, acknowledges the fact that Pennsylvania State University, like many other public universities, was in part established to the purchase of vast amounts of land that has been determined to have been stolen from a multitude of indigenous tribes. Across the United States, universities are acknowledging their role in the displacement of thousands of indigenous people. By acknowledging this history, universities are able to begin to come with terms with the negative socioeconomic impacts towards indigenous communities, while committing to actively find ways to reconcile with indigenous peoples to find ways to rectify the moral wrongs in the past. As a result of this, it's now suggested that the chair of the General Assembly, General Assembly meeting will recite the following statement for the land acknowledgement. And I'm going to pass it off if you would like to. No, okay, um, never mind. I'm going to 
read off the acknowledgement. It's the UPUA acknowledges that the Indigenous Peoples Student Association is perpetually working on a living land acknowledgement that requires further research and patience and that the statement cannot be solidified within the governing documents for this said reasoning. The statement made by the chair is also subject to change depending on updates issued from the Indigenous People Association. Does anyone have any questions? And with that, we will now open up the floor for questions to Chair Flegel. Are there any questions for Chair Flegel? If, if so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Seeing no questions to Chair Flegel, I will now close the floor for questions. We will now open the floor up for discussion. Is there any discussion on the policy? All right, hi everyone. Um, so this is something that I'm really excited about um, and something that has been worked on with um, Tim and who is the president of the Indigenous Peoples Student Association. Um, University of Virginia and many other land grant universities have established um, within their student governments um, a statement to be made. Um, as you are aware, I have been making the statement um, in my report. This just solidifies the process for years to come on the chair officially making that statement and giving the proper acknowledgement that is deserved um, by the indigenous tribes that did inhabit the land that this university was built on and ensuring that we remain educated representatives and, in, and know that this land was of course um, built on land that was forcibly taken and removed from indigenous tribes. Um, and that hopefully will be sustained for years to come. Um, and it's really just a further step, although not a final step, um, to rectify the wrongs of the past um, in terms of what the UPA can directly do to ensure that. Um, so thank you for yielding me time. And Representative uh, Speaker Gibbard, given that you can't raise your hand, I will now call on you. Sydney Gibbard, College of Engineering, sorry. Um, I was just gonna explain this one change at the bottom here, um, just because it's not necessarily related to the land acknowledgement. Um, basically someone, I don't know, for some reason the constitution and bylaws, or I think the bylaws actually um, don't have they are referencing the 14th assembly throughout the bylaws. And I was just gonna make a motion to change that to the 16th assembly. Um, it's just a small change, but I just wanted to like be transparent and explain why that's at the bottom. Thank you, Speaker Gibbard. Is there any further discussion on the policy? Seeing none, I will now close the floor for discussion. And we will now move to a vote by roll call, given that it is policy. Secretary Campos, you may begin whenever you are ready. Arfi Kalor. Yes. Alia Fedorov. Yes. Anne Marie Round Sorensen. Yes. Brandon Walker. Yes. Kara Flegel. Yes. Carter Gangle. Yes. Kathy Zhao. David Morgan. Yes. Donald Impavito. Yes. Emmanuel Monte. Yes. Hope Steger. Yes. Holden Ingalls. Jasmine Boldick. Yes. Jason Nelson. Yes. Janelle Luazo. Yes. Jordan Diebler. Yes. George Durango Espen. Yes. Joshua Reynolds. Yes. Caitlin Farrar. Yes. Kyle Quinn. Yes. Lakin Meter. Lewis Richardson. Yes. Marie Missiner. Yes. Marissa Gillespie. Yes. Matthew DeAngelis. Yes. Megan Neely. Yes. Michael DeBoten. 
Michael Jablonski? Yes. Noah Robertson? Yes. Patricia Burungi? Yes. Raina Alexander? Yes. Refugio Lara? Ryan Lascalzo? Yes. Samantha Brown? Yes. Samuel Aja? Yes. Sean Terry? Yes. Selena Go? Yes. <clears throat> Beth Constein? Yes. Steven Zhang? Yes. Sydney Gibbard? Yes. Again, please hold as we go ahead and cross-reference the votes. Thank you. Thank you all. Policy 0316, addition of a land acknowledgement to the meeting agenda passes with the unanimous vote of 35, zero to zero. We will now move into line item G, policy 0416, budget for the 2021-2022 academic year. Speaker Gibbard, will you please introduce this policy? Yes, give me one second to share. All right, um, so this will be one of the last times you're hearing from me and it's the last time I'm presenting something tonight. So um, yeah, but basically it's just the budget. Um, we presented on this earlier today, so I really won't take up too much more time, um, but basically we just have outlined it all here. Um, I don't know how much it was emphasized earlier, but these are really just guidelines um, for UPA to follow throughout the year. Um, we're not gonna get in trouble if we don't follow these guidelines. Obviously we can't go over our total of 150,000 um, by the end of the year, but if different programming weeks require more funding and some of them require less, um, that's totally acceptable and that'll be approved by the legislative body um, through bills. Um, but yeah, with that, I will stand for any questions. With that, we will now move into questions for Speaker Gibbard. Are there any questions for Speaker Gibbard? Representative Lascalzo. Uh, Ryan Lascalzo, line prior representative. Uh, this question isn't really about the bill itself, but more of like the context around it. So the, uh, the we get the, our money from the student fee board. And I know we don't actively request any changes in our amount for like a three year period at a time. I was just wondering when is our next uh, request coming up? Yeah, so I will try to answer that. I know that we were last approved on February 28th, 2020. So three years, I believe it will be 2023 is when we do our next proposal, but um, President Bose or anyone on the fee board, correct me if that is incorrect. I believe you're right by saying 2023. Um, if Barry has a different answer though, um, he would definitely be more informed, but I believe it's 2023. I know the presentation might be like, it might be in either 2022 or 2023, but we won't get that approval until 2023, basically. Just one more thing to add on that point. We do present every single year um, to the student fee board now that was that was just reinstated. So um, we, we present our budget every single year just as a hearing, um, but we don't get that reallocation looked at or, or approved or anything for a three year period. Thank you, Representative Lascalzo. Are there any further questions for Speaker Gibbard? If so, please raise your hand. And if not, I will move on. Okay, I will now close the floor for questions and I will now open the floor for any discussion on the policy. Is there any discussion on this policy? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing no discussion on this policy, I will now close the floor for discussion and we will now move into a vote by roll call due to this being a policy with Secretary Campos. Secretary Campos, you may begin whenever you are ready. Arthi Kalor. Yes. 
Aliyah Federoff? Yes. Anne Marie Round Sorensen? Yes. Brandon Walker? Yes. Kara Flegel? Carter Gangle? Yes. Kathy Zhao? Yes. <laughs> David Morgan? Yes. Donald Impavito? Yes. Emmanuel Monte? Yes. Hope Steger? Yes. Holden Ingalls? Jasmine Bolduck? Yes. Jason Nelson? Yes. Janelle Luazo? Yes. Jordan Diebler? Yes. George Durango Espin? Yes. Joshua Reynolds? Yes. Caitlin Farrar? Yes. Kyle Quinn? Yes. Lakin Meter? Yes. Lewis Richardson? Yes. Marie Missner? Yes. Marissa Gillespie? Yes. Matthew DeAngelis? Yes. Megan Neely? Yes. Michael DeBoten? Michael Jablonski? Yes. Noah Robertson? Yes. Patricia Brungi? Yes. Raina Alexander? Yes. Refugio Lara? Ryan Lascalzo? Yes. Samantha Brown? Yes. Samuel Aja? Yes. Sean Terry? Yes. Selena Go? Yes. Seth Constein? Yes. Steven Zhang? Yes. Sydney Gibbard? Yes. Thank you all. We will now cross reference the vote count for this policy. Please hold as we do so. Thank you all. Policy 0416, budget for the 2021-2022 academic year passes with a unanimous vote of 37, zero to zero. We will now move into line item H, resolution 0216, a resolution against anti-Semitism and in support of the adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IHRA definition. Chair Kuller, will you please introduce this resolution? Yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm super excited to be bringing this resolution to the floor. Um, I just wanted to give a special thank you to Penn State Hillel for all of their hard work and just thank them for bringing this to our attention. Um, so basically in the nature of the situation, it covers a lot of the um, hate crimes against the Jewish community, um, things such as the uh, synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh or the chants during the Charlottesville protests in 2017. And then it goes into different um, colleges and um, anti-Semitic bullying towards students, um, both at Penn State and at various other universities. Um, some things to note specifically at Penn State, uh, the menorah outside the ZBT fraternity was stolen and vandalized in 2018. The menorah outside the Chabad house was also van was vandalized in 2019 and it was stolen in 2019. And there's been 17 recognized incidents of anti-Semitism between 2001 and 2018. And then it goes on to explaining the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and their, um, established, they established a working definition of anti-Semitism. 
And this definition uh, reflects modern anti-Semitism rather than outdated ideas of what anti-Semitism is. Um, and yeah, and then in the recommended course of action, basically we are calling the PUA to recognize this definition as well as um, work towards combating anti-Semitism at Penn State. And then we will also be sending a, a copy of this resolution to President Eric Barron and Vice President of Student Affairs, Damon Simmons. And once again, just really wanted to thank Penn State Halal and everyone who worked on this resolution. Thank you, I now stand for questions. Thank you, Chair Kuller. We will now move into questions. Are there any questions for Chair Kuller? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Seeing no questions for Chair Kuller, we will now move into discussion. Is there any discussion on this resolution? If so, please raise your hand. Representative Alexander. Marina Alexander at large. Um, I just like to emphasize how important this is for the Jewish community at Penn State. Um, the representatives from Hillel who came and spoke with us at, for, on our on Friday at our meeting, um, just really emphasized how uh, important this was to them and to their club and to the community on campus. Um, and I think that as a, not as not only as a committee for justice and equity, but as a student government, we need to be listening to the voices of our constituents. And I think this is the best way that we can do this for their community. Thank you, Representative Alexander. Representative Impavito. Yeah, uh, so when I saw this, I was really excited uh, when I saw this uh, bill. I've also had a few uh, Jewish students reach out to me about it and told me how great it would be if I would sign it, and I agreed. Um, I think it's a great move for the Jewish students here at the Penn State, and I look forward to putting this into play. Thank you, Res uh, thank you Representative Impavito. And just a reminder, please state your name and constituency. Um, Representative Steger. Hope Seeger at large. I just wanted to say that this is a like, I think this um this is this has a clear vote. And I think everyone um should understand that this is so important because I think anti-Semitism is often overlooked. And I I've never had so many people reach out to me and try to talk to me as a representative um, about a piece of legislation before. I had multiple members DM me and try to explain why this is important. And I was like, yes, I completely understand. And that's all I have to say. I just think this should be an overwhelming um, yes. Thank you, Representative Morgan. Uh, David Morgan at large. Uh, I've been in contact with uh, Lions for Israel um, and some of their members there, and they were talking to me about the need for this uh, bill to get passed. And I think that it should have all of our support. Uh, it's important that we fight against anti-Semitism, and I think this is um, a good step in the right direction. Speaker Gibbard. Um, yeah, I'm just going to motion for a few amendments. Um, they're literally all just about like all these words in green were just things that were spelled incorrectly. And so I just the green is the correct spelling of them. So I motion to make all those and then add lime numbers for the rest of this part right here before they're respectfully submitted. Sure, Killer, is that accepted as friendly? Yes, it is. Okay, so those amendments are added given that it's accepted as friendly. Thank you, Speaker Gibbard. Um, Representative Dibler. Um, yes, just a motion to pass by unanimous consent. Okay, is there any discussion on that motion? And is there a second? Okay, seeing that there is no discussion and seeing that that is seconded, this resolution has been officially passed by unanimous consent. Uh, congratulations. All right, we will now move into resolution 0316 in support of Advocate Penn State's double Pell campaign. Chair Meter, will you please introduce this resolution? Yes. Um, so, hey everyone. Um, sorry, I had to switch over to my phone. So if there's a shared screen, I can't see it. So, okay, cool, there is one. Um, so basically this resolution, um, like the title says, is in support of Advocate Penn State's double Pell campaign. Basically the Pell Grant is um, a federal financial aid um, program that helps low-income students. Um, it gives them grants 
essentially um, to help pay for their education. However, there has been no increase in funding for the Pell Grant for many years. Its purchasing power is lower than what it was in 1978. Um, which really does a disservice not only to students who really need financial help, but also our um, workforce. Um, so basically advocate Penn State, which is through the Office of Government and Community Relations, has joined a lot of other institutions across the country in advocating to Congress to double the Pell Grant. Um, so this is really just supporting their efforts in that. Um, so in the recommended course of action, we basically just um, are advocating or we're supporting advocating to the students to, to sign on to the, um, it's called an action alert. So it's not really filling out a petition. Basically, if you go to the website, there's a form that's already completely filled out for you. You just put your name, your um, address and what, like, what kind of student you are, undergraduate, graduate student, things like that. And it will send a letter directly to your representative with all of the information already inside of it. Um, and they also wanted us to um, support their social medias because that's where they will be posting a lot of updates about this as well as other issues related to this. Um, so this also charges the Department of Communications with um, <clears throat> posting things about this on their social media and tagging Advocate Penn State in it so that students can easily find that. Um, I don't know if I make this amendment now, but I will be making an amendment to change the Department of Communications to the Department of Public Relations. Um, but other than that, um, I stand for any questions. And are there any questions for Chair Meter? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Seeing no questions for Chair Meter, we will now move into the discussion. Is there any discussion on this resolution? If so, please raise your hand. And Chair Meter, would you be willing to remake that amendment for discussion? Uh, yes, I motion to amend Department of Communications to Department of Public Relations. And seeing that there is a second and that it is accepted as friendly, that will be added. All right, is there any further discussion on the resolution? Please raise your hand if so. Representative Reynolds. If nobody else has any discussion, I would motion to vote by unanimous consent. Great, seeing that there is general consensus over this um, in seconds, this resolution passes unanimously. Uh, congratulations, Chair Meter. We will now move into line item J, resolution 0416, supporting a COVID vaccine requirement for the 2021 2022 academic year at Penn State University Park. Representative Robertson, will you please introduce this? Or is there another representative that will be introducing this aside from Representative Robertson? Um, if Noah's not here, I can do it. Okay, Chair Meter. Okay, um, hey guys, sorry I didn't prepare anything, so this is kind of on the fly. Um, so basically this is a resolution encouraging Penn State to require vaccinations for the fall 2020 semester um, for anybody that will be here in person. Basically a lot of universities have started um, saying that they will require vaccinations one of them being Rutgers University, which is um, a Big Ten university. So we usually tend to follow what other Big Ten schools are doing. We expect that as um, things continue down the line over summer, more and more universities will also be doing similar things. Um, the resolution goes into a lot of statistics about why we need um, vaccinations. Penn State has been listed twice that I remember as one of the top um, hotspots for COVID-19 in the country. Um, so really we do need to ensure that we're keeping both the students and the community as safe as possible, which can be done through requiring vaccines. Um, yesterday during Faculty Senate, President Barron announced that he will be strongly encouraging students to get vaccines. And if you go onto the Penn State Student Affairs website, it does have it listed under vaccinations that they encourage students to get. Um, but encouragement can only go so far. Um, we really do need to ensure that 
like I said, we're keeping students safe, which can only be done through requiring them. Um, Penn State currently does already require students to get certain vaccines, including measles, mumps, and rubella. Um, and if you live on campus, you're also required to get um, the meningococcal vaccine, meningococcal. Um, so there is precedent of Penn State requiring students to get vaccines. So it's not like this is anything out of the ordinary. Um, so in the recommended course of action, that's exactly what we are recommending that they do, um, which is require students to get their vaccines before returning to campus in the fall. We recommend that um, students have to have them two weeks before the semester starts, since it takes, I believe, two weeks um, after you get your vaccine for it to be fully effective. Um, and we do have something included in the, in the bottom that um, creates sort of leeway for students who may have religious reasons that they can't get this, maybe certain health reasons, um, and also um, international students. We are aware that students in other countries don't have the same access to vaccines. Um, and the vaccines that a lot of them do have aren't technically FDA approved in America, so that um, creates a little bit of conflict. So <clears throat> we do recognize that there is some extenuating circumstances that may prevent students from getting the vaccine. Um, but other than that, we are recommending that we do require them for the fall semester. With that, I can stand for any questions. And are there any questions for Chair Meter? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Representative DeAngelis. Hey guys, okay, uh, Representative DeAngelis at large. Um, first, I would like to preface that I do agree with the vaccine. I do think I want you to get it. Um, I am not an anti-vaxxer, just <laughs> prefacing this. Um, so I would just like to bring up the point of, um, I do think everyone should get the vaccine. I think that it should be highly recommended. However, all of the vaccines that were mentioned did happen to be FDA approved. Um, this is just approved through emergency um, order authorization. And um, I don't think the university really can make students get a vaccine that hasn't even been approved by the FDA. However, I would like to say, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> I will be even getting the vaccine tomorrow, um, but I just don't think it is the university park, <laughs> um, like our duty to make people get the vaccine or like, make this kind of decision for someone um however like if it was of course fda approved um something of that sort totally different story um i would also like to bring up the point if there is like a timeline for when we see the vaccine getting approved once it is approved we can reconvene then make an actual statement on this however i do think it's way too early to make this kind of decision and then from there make a decision um based on uh, the FDA's approval. Okay, uh, just a reminder, we are in questions. Um, are there any questions to Chair Meter before we move on? Again, please raise your, please lower your hand if you are in discussion for that. Okay, Representative Impovito. Yeah, hi, Representative Impovito, um, College of IST. Uh, my question was, um, how long was the process of working on this bill as opposed to when it was released? Because it seems like a short timeline. Yeah, um, I'll be completely honest. Noah approached me yesterday asking if this is something that I would sign on to him with and help him write. I think that's largely due to the fact that this is our last UPA meeting. So it was either get it in now or wait till the fall semester. And at that point, it's already fall semester. We can't require anything. So I think that's why there was such a quick turnaround time. Um, I think this was also in response to the BJC now offering walk-in vaccinations. Um, I do completely understand that a lot of students will be going back home and they may not have such easy access to getting vaccines, although over summer things, um, it is open to all adults. So hopefully by the time that summer comes, most students will have had that vaccine. And if not, they could they can potentially fall under the extenuating circumstance um, group. Um, so yeah, it, it was a quick turnaround time, um, but I think that's just the nature of how much time we have left in the assembly. 
Thank you, Representative Empavito. Representative Dibler. Uh, Representative Jordan Dibler uh, at large. Uh, wouldn't you say it's just better, uh, just kind of echoing off of what you just said, wouldn't you say it's better to not rush this, something like this? Because like, as you just said, we're kind of trying to get it through right away. But for this, I feel like it's definitely not something we'd want to rush. And additionally, wouldn't you say it's better to kind of survey the student body and see what they have to say about this before we actually go ahead and push this through? Um, one thing that I can say is I did speak to someone today within the OGCR. Um, I asked her what she thinks about requiring vaccinations. Um, she said that she does, the university will have to take into consideration other stakeholders um, and other implications that come with passing something like this. This is mainly us just telling the university as, as the leader of the student body, as the voice of the student body, we believe that it is both supported by students and within the best interest of best interest of students to provide as safe of an environment as possible. Um, in terms of this being of us not spending enough time on it, um, the research is there that supports not only how many students and how many community members have had COVID, but also the fact that other universities across the country are already taking this stand in requiring. Um, vaccination. So it's not like we're just sort of pulling this out of thin air within the past 24 hours and throwing this on the assembly. This does have precedent um, and it is backed up by a lot of research. Okay, so we have a point of information to address, but before we address that one, um, everything that's put in the chat, please make, please utilize modern rules. Um, for example, point of procedure. Um, I will say, please ensure that questions are specifically in relation to the logistical research or content to a resolution or a bill, um, please make sure that we are being reminded of that. Um, and two, I will go into addressing the point of information that was addressed by Chair Flegel. Chair Flegel. Kara Flegel at large, um, I just wanted to bring up the point that we do have a seventh meeting that will be held this summer. Uh, so while this is like the last meeting of the academic year, we will be re reconvening again before the fall. So this might be a good idea to potentially look at this in a week or two. And just a reminder, please pose um, points of information as just questions or just general commentary. Um, Representative Zhang. Yeah, Stephen Singh at large. I'd also like to make a point of information just in case people are, are confused. Like, I feel like we're trending towards this, but um, we don't make any binding decisions. Like, this is just, like, if we pass this resolution, it's saying that we support this idea and we're going to bring it to um, as many, you know, different uh, stakeholders, I guess, as possible on administration side to say, like, hey, the students support this. So I do definitely like, you know, I feel like some of the questions or, or some of the concerns are trending towards like, if we pass this, it will happen. But I, I think that, you know, just, just so people know this doesn't happen just because we pass it. This is just saying that the UPUA supports this. We, we don't have like binding power. Yeah, I would just, thank you. I would just ask that for just general discussion points, we can save these points for discussion, but these are relevant to the context um, of kind of the questionings and kind of the direction that we're going on. Um, so thank you for, keeping that relevant. Um, and thank you, Representative Brown Sorensen, for that point. Um, just, again, be sure that we're rele relegating it completely to questions for this period. Um, Representative Constein. Yeah, hi, Seth Constein, at large representative. Um, I was just wondering if we know where like the student body stands on like requiring a vaccine uh, to return in the fall. Um, yeah, so, there definitely has not been official surveying done. Um, and again, I think that is due to the fact that this, we wanted to make sure that we were getting this in before fall. Um, that's not to say that we just generalized what the opinion of students might be. Um, I don't know off the top of my head the specific statistic, but an overwhelming amount of students have already began getting their vaccines, um, a lot of them at the BJC. Um, so because of that, it is the general trend that a lot of students support getting the vaccines. Um, this is just going the extra step to say, we have all these, most students have the resources to get the vaccine. Um, it is encouraged to get the vaccine by the CDC. Um, and we just as a university want to ensure that we are also requiring students to get it. Um, so just to answer your question formally, um, there has not been surveying to students 
Um, but it is the general trend of the way things have been going that this is largely supported by um, a majority of students. Thank you, Representative Terry. Hi, Sean Terry at large. I just for full reference, I am a co-sponsor on this bill. I, I read it over with them, uh, um, but I, I ch chair me there. I just wanted to ask, um, in regards to Matt's uh, Matt uh, Representative DeAngelis's point, um, perhaps would you be willing to accept an amendment uh, to the resolution saying once the vaccines are FDA approved, we recommend that. Um, the university, you know, requires this. So just adding in that thing, if we do want to pass it tonight, so that is set in there, or I just want to know your thoughts on that. Um, so I think we could definitely have discussion on that if the majority of students, and I will yield time to Representative Ron Sorensen to also answer. Um, I think we can definitely have discussion on that. I'm not sure of the technicalities of FDA approved for emergency use versus FDA approved for general because all three vaccines, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson are FDA approved for emergency use. Um, but if other representatives wanna discuss that, you can make um, a motion for an amendment and discussion and we can talk about it. Um, if most students or most representatives support that, I would be fine with adding that, but I can yield time to Representative Ron Sorensen if she'd like to also talk about it. Um, I do just like want like as a co-sponsor, I want to be clear that like uh, an emergency approval by the FDA is still an approval by the FDA. Like that's the FDA still approved this vaccine for that. And we saw like with Johnson and Johnson, they can stop like that, like they can stop the administration of vaccines if they're unsafe and that's what they did. And so if there was a situation where the FDA found out like, hey, like this is really bad. I feel like one, we would have known about that by now because this has been like, we've been getting vaccinated since December and January. And second, like they're all 95, like they're everything except Johnson and Johnson is 95% effective. And there are no like crazy known side effects. And like, again, the FDA did approve it. Like, I just wanna be super clear emergency approval is FDA approval, like that it's the FDA. Just super clear about that. Okay, um, I do wanna make reference, I'm Representative Constine Deibler. This will be, um, Const Representative Constine, you will be first and then Representative Deibler, you will be second. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, back Seth Constine, Allo rep. Um, and thank you for answering my previous question. You explained that well. I just had like a quick follow up on it. Um, and that is like, do we know generally why like students who haven't been vaccinated yet, like why they're not getting vaccinated? Is there like a, like a consensus or is it like their opinion or religious reasons? Like what's the, do we know like the majority reason why they're not getting vaccinated? Um, while I have not conducted any research about that, so I can't give you like a data-driven response, I would say probably the majority of students that haven't been vaccinated um, are either in the position that I'm in, I'm just, I'm getting mine soon, I just haven't gotten it yet. Um, also religious reasons, I'm sure. Um, and I think also a lot of it comes down to either not wanting a vaccination, there are people who are um, anti-vaxxers and I don't mean that in like a derogatory sense, they just don't wanna get vaccinations. Um, or there has been, I'm sure as everyone knows, a lot of fake news that has been thrown around in terms of the vaccine, the side effects, um, all of the technicalities behind it. And I'm sure that's a reason that a lot of students cho are choosing not to get it. Um, but I would dare to say that m except for the case of religious um, or location-wise reasons, it's because they just simply don't want to get them. And that's sort of the reason why we want to go a step further other than just encouraging it because students who are choosing not to get it just because they don't want to, um, like that's not really, like you can't just choose to not get your mom's vaccine because you don't want to get a mom's vaccine, like you have to get that. So I feel, we feel like this should be under that same purview. Sorry, I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure the exact reason why most people aren't, th those who haven't gotten it aren't. Yeah, that was good, thank you. Representative Seeger. Hi, um, this is kind of like a clarification. It's just a question that I genuinely don't know the answer to. 
Um, how does one go about proving their like religious reasons to avoid or just not get a vaccine? Like, is there a like form? Like, I just, I don't know if anyone knows the answer to this, but I was just curious to kind of understand it better. Um, if anyone knows the specific reason, I can yield time from my understanding. I don't think you have to prove your religion. I think it's as simple as saying, for religious reasons, I don't want to get this. Um, I think for most students, like while that means you could, I guess, technically lie, I don't think most students would do that. I think if Penn State's requiring you to get something, um, most students would get it. Although I think if it is for religious reasons, you can simply just write a letter, whatever like way they would have for you to submit that. You can just say that you have religious reasons. Um, but Representative Brown Sorensen, I can yield time to you. Uh, thank you. So I just want to say like, this is like, just like based on previous experience, you can like, and like things that I know, be, whatever, like I've done reasonable accommodations for my asthma. So the process like, you have to, if you would be getting a reasonable accommodation is basically what it is. And you have to print out the form. You have to take it to your doctor. Your doctor has to like understand your religious exemption. And if you have like a health thing, like I know people with a peanut allergy can't get the vaccine. So like, if you have a peanut allergy, you would take it to your allergist and like, they would just fill out this form for you and then you would bring it back um and same like with religious exemptions like I think there's like a process to it out like with your with your doctor but then you, there are forms provided by Penn State for you to fill out like when you're enrolling in Penn like when you're enrolling in your classes or whatever when you first commit to Penn State whatever like you can print out forms for that stuff um and it's I don't think it's like an easy process because like have like getting a religious exemption for something like this is serious like and it should be taken seriously so I like don't think that students are like going to just be lying about their religion if they're getting an exemption um but like it's it's a process that like is university approved like whatever you go through those steps thank you are there any further questions for chair meter or any of the co-sponsors on this resolution Seeing none, I'm now going to close the floor for questions and we will now move into discussion. If you do have a, if you have any points of discussion, please raise your hand and I will call on your name. Um, before we get into this, I, I do acknowledge that this is um, something that people, uh, many representatives wanna to contribute to, which is in your right. I would just, again, restate that you have two minutes to uh, basically make your speech during this discussion period. I mean, you can only speak two times unless another representative yields you time. So I'll be going down the queue as I see the hands, um, and please be cognizant of that. Um, remember to address the chair, always, never address another representative moving forward. Um, and that being said, we will now move and begin with Chair Meter. Hi, um, I motion to add the amendment that's under the RCA in green. It reads, this flexibility should include working with international students who may face additional barriers to obtaining vaccines. Okay, seeing that the co-sponsor did make that amendment, it is automatically friendly, so that is accepted. Um, thank you, Chair Meter. I will now call on Representative Round Sorensen. Um, hi, Representative Round Sorensen. So I am a co-sponsor of this, but I also just like want to speak like um, in my role as an RA and like my experience with COVID and being an RA. Um, I came to Penn State in August for four days. Um, I was going to be an RA in East. I had my room all set up. I posted a fun TikTok about it and I was so excited to get to work and like help people. Um, it was like a huge personal decision for me to like to go down to Penn State despite like spending like the rest of like the entire lockdown home. Like I didn't see my friends for over a year. And so it was like, I'm going to come down. I'm going to do this. I'm so excited. And then I get to Penn State and a day the first day that we have students there they're literally doing a twerk circle out and like the like out in the quad two nights in a row and I had to live in a room with those people like or like on a floor with those people I had to share a bathroom with them and I as like an RA I felt terrified to live on campus with people who weren't vaccinated who don't follow the rules correctly and like when we were already in the middle of an outbreak so like it's literally terrifying to be working in those buildings like that when people like when COVID is a thing. And so I get that like, oh yeah, like we don't want to like, we don't want to put like 
who are in like a bad situation, but like we don't just send kids into dorms to live there by themselves. Like they're there and RAs have to be like, those floors have to be staffed. So someone is working on that floor, on those floors. And so it's like occupational health and safety basically for people to be vaccinated. Like that's a work, that's someone's workplace. And so we should be like respecting the fact that like hundreds of RAs are going to be exposed to people living on campus. Um, so them being vaccinated, I know I'm going to be living with freshmen and I'm already scared. Like I, I'm going to be living in renovated. Most people are going to be vaccinated. I'm already scared about being exposed and I'm vaccinated. So like, I think that this is bigger than just, oh, like we don't want to ruffle any feathers. Like people could die. And like, we've had conversations like this in the 15th assembly about like COVID kills people. And so when we're talking about vaccines, we are literally talking about life and death. So when we see precedent set at other major universities, I feel like we should be following suit because we are, oh my God, like it's a pattern. We are always behind other schools. Um, yeah, like I have 30 more seconds, so I'll make it quick. But like, this is one of those times where Penn State could like really step up and like be a leader in the Big Ten for something like this. And I think that we should definitely take that seriously. Um, but yeah, thank you. And um, I'll yield my time now. Thank you, Representative Ron Sorensen. Representative Lascalzo, you have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Lascalzo, Lion Pride representative. Um, I just wanted to come out in support of this piece of legislation. I think it's fairly logical. I think at the rate that vac vaccines are being distributed, not just by Penn State, but by the country and by Pennsylvania, it should be fairly easy or simple for students to be vaccinated by the fall. And I think it's if the university is to require it, it would be very simple for the university to also help out with those efforts as they currently are. I think it is a public safety issue, not just for the students on campus, but for the community that Penn State exists within. If you look at our, if you look at the borough council and look at how many retirees are on there, look at other retiree, look at, you can tell how many elderly are in our area. We don't wanna hurt them. We don't wanna hurt this community that we benefit from and that they benefit us being there from as well. We wanna make sure that we are doing the a safe and effective method of being college students. And that's why I support this piece of legislation. Also, um, this is just a kind of a weird side point. I heard someone say that there might be a, a, a summer assembly um, during the Q&A session, but there are so many Q&As. Uh, whoever said that, could they please explain what they meant? Because I don't believe the UPUA is allowed to have summer assemblies unless we pass legislation tonight saying that we are allowed to have a meeting. So yeah, I'm in support of this. And then I have that like minor question for whoever said that. Okay, um, I'm gonna continue with the queue. I mean, we can clarify that towards the end just to make sure all points are addressed. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Representative Lascalzo. Um, no one has done this yet, but I do want to be cognizant of procedure. If you do hear a point that has been raised already, please lower your hand as so we do not become an echo chamber um, and make inefficient use of, of course, our discussion time. Um, again, that's just procedure. Um, and we will move on to Representative Terry. Hi, Sean Terry at large. I, I did want to say that, um, again, I am a co-sponsor of this bill. I fully think that everybody on campus should be vaccinated for the safety of, uh, of everybody in our community here at State College. Um, I, I would say that there, there is a difference between FDA emergency authorization and the, you know, applying for a license through the biologics license application. Um, th th it, I can reference two doctors, Dr. William Schaffner, who is the professor of infectious diseases at Vanderbilt University, um, an affiliate with the CDC, and Dr. Arnold Monto, who is a professor of epidemiology at University of Michigan School of Public Health, and also the acting chair of the FDA's Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, um, who have said, quote, um, after the clinical trials are finished, the difference between the emergency use authorization and full licensure from the public's information or knowledge is basically the duration of follow-up or safety, not efficacy. So the efficacy requirements are the same, but the long-term tracking and safety of the vaccines is not the same. They are very different. Um, I personally would agree with Anne-Marie, uh, Representative Ron Sorensen's point that 
if there was any short-term side effects by now, we probably would have seen it. Almost 40% of the country has one dose or more. Um, and I, I think it would be I think it would be irresponsible to to say um, that, oh, there, there's something that that's lurking behind the corner. But I also think it would be irresponsible to say it's not out of the realm of possibility that any long term side effects can occur from the vaccine since it has not been fully FDA approved. So I think uh, I would point lend point to to Matt's uh, sorry, Representative um, D'Angelis's point from earlier. Um, and, and would say just to keep that in mind, if we do want to make any amendments, um, I just think it's really important that we do keep that in mind. I'm not trying to be an anti-vaxxer. I have both shots of Pfizer right in my arm. So I'm, if I'm going to get any side effects, I'm, I'm waiting for them. But uh, I, I do think it's an important discussion to have and, and that we take, in, take that in mind. Thank you, Representative Terry. I will now address a point of inquiry that was brought up since it does need to be addressed. Um, in accordance to the bylaws in 3.7.2, summer of general assembly meetings, the assembly may convene during the summer session electronically or physically for the transaction of normal business by either a motion calling for such action on a specific date or on a date specified by the chair. Um, part A specifically says one week's notice will be required for such meetings. And then part B simply says quorum shall be two thirds of representatives. Um, that is what is in the bylaws when it does come and pertain to summer meetings um, and in ending of addressing that point of inquiry. Um, I'll now move further into the queue. Uh, Representative Zhang. Yeah, uh, Stephen Zhang at large. I, I do fully support this resolution because I think, uh, you know, a lot of these contingencies have been answered. Like if someone has a medical conflict with using a vaccine or someone has a religious reason that prevents them from receiving a vaccination. Uh, they don't need to. And if an international student or other students aren't able to receive a vaccine before they, you know, return to campus, um, those fall under extenuating circumstances. I hope that Penn State would work with them to, to really get those cases one-on-one -on -one sorted out so they can come back to campus safely and also make sure that the rest of campus is safe. Um, and if those aren't clear enough, I do see there could be room for amendments. And again, like, if that's something that you are, you know, something that you think you'd like to see in there, I definitely encourage it. Just write one on the floor. You don't have to pass it. You know, we, we tried to pass amendments earlier so people are in the know, but you can do it right now. And I think, you know, instead of saying, no, I don't think that this is, you know, because it's missing that little bit, we shouldn't pass it. Um, because really, out of, besides that, um, the FDA contingency answer has been given already as well. And if that's something that people are uncomfortable with, putting that in as a stipulation that FDA full approval is done first is, again, another potential amendment. I mean, in this case, we've covered most of these bases for legitimately not getting a vaccine besides really just not wanting to. So if you can think of anything else, please speak on why and put forth an amendment so we can really just take care of it. Uh, and because we don't really know when the next time will be when we convene or when it's going to be an emergency meeting over the summer if we do have one and we try not to just because it's, you know, people's summers. Um, yeah, so I, I also want to address the point, like I, I don't believe that we need to survey students on issues like this because it is something that's meant to correct students with these contingencies answered. And we are trying to, to try to, you know, answer everything in a way that um, every student is taken care of. So, so really, I, I don't really, there's a lot of things that we vote on um, without getting uh, points from, from the student body. I think the ones that we do want to get survey data on are things that could be more political or things that could, you know, ultimately have um, a very decisive, divisive opinion. I think that there's the science behind vaccines. I think that, you know, vaccines are something that are proven to be effective. And again, there's a lot of FDA support surrounding it. So I don't necessarily know if a vote or, or student survey is necessary because I don't think that this is something that really needs to be really debated on, on efficacy or whether or not we should get vaccines. Um, so yeah, I think that this is pretty comprehensive already, but I encourage any other amendments to make it more comprehensive. I don't think that we really needed a survey on this unless you look at this as more of an opinion piece, in which case I think that is a separate discussion in itself, um, but I, I don't necessarily know if we uh, need to really push this back another date versus just addressing a lot of these issues today and moving forward with it. Um, I fully support it as it is right now, but I'm also, also open for this. Thank you. And what I will state again, no repetitive points have been made, um, but I just want to keep that in mind. If you do hear a point that's been made, please lower your hand um, as to not become an echo chamber. Um, and I will also now ask for a motion to extend the meeting time to 1040. Again, I'm just settling on 1040 because it is um, a safe amount. Is there a second for that? Okay. 
there was a motion and a second. Um, and I'm not seeing any opposition. So we are officially extending meeting time until 1045. All right, thank you all. We will now move back into discussion in the queue with Representative Luazo. Hi, um, um, Representative Luazo of uh, Black Caucus. I just want to state in order for like this disease to go away, we must hit herd immunity. Herd immunity is about 75%. And the reason why is it's 75% is because of that gap of people who cannot receive the vaccine due to um, allergies or religious reasons. In addition, if people are having like maybe issues with side effects. The only vaccine that had problems with side effects was the Johnson & Johnson with the blood clots. The percentage wise was 0.008%. You have a higher chance of getting blood clots using birth control or getting COVID itself. So just wanna address that there. And personally, I'm all in favor for this resolution. Last semester, I was, um, on campus, I had an apartment, but then some point in the semester, my roommate had COVID. And so I had to leave the apartment because she couldn't leave due to her parents being high risk. And I had to stay in a hotel for, for two days and then stay with another friend for three weeks until Thanksgiving break. In addition to that, my parents control if I go back to school or not. And for the start of the semester, they're like, we don't think it's safe for you to go back. So I think a lot of other students are in this predicament is like, they don't have the personal freedom to go back to school or not. It's mainly up to their parents or guardians. So also like others have mentioned, this isn't like a work cry, like once this is passed, like it's not going to be like, okay, now everyone has to get a vaccine. It's obviously going to go to the administration and probably through them, they're going to make a survey like they did. Uh, I think in the beginning of fall semester, they asked if you were coming back to campus and then um, I think this semester they asked for fall if you were not coming back to semester with the raise your hand policy. And in, a, in addition, um, well over 200 million people have been vaccinated. And I just think there just has to be more advocacy because like, again, if you want COVID to go away and you want your personal freedoms that like you must get vaccinated because the longer we don't hit herd immunity, the longer COVID is gonna stay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Luazo. Uh, Representative Morgan. Uh, Representative Morgan, at large representative. Uh, I would like to preface this and say that I am pro vaccination. Um, however, I am not pro a public university uh, forcing its students to get a, a vaccination that doesn't have enough uh, research on it. Um, there was previously mentioned was uh, the fact that this vaccine was approved by the FDA. Um, a recent study by the CN, uh, from CNN stated that um, a third of uh, drugs approved by the FDA have had uh, problematic side effects um, from 2000 to 2015. Um, and the normal span for a uh, vaccine to get approved is 10, uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, now, personally, I'm, I'm scheduled for the vaccine next week, um, but I think that there should be, rather than forcing it, there should be an incentive, uh, you know, incentivize uh, the vaccines in some way try to make sure that we can get all the students motivated in, uh, to get this vaccine, but I believe that forcing it is the wrong route. Thank you, Representative Morgan. Representative Neely. Hi, Megan Neely, College of Arts and Architecture. I would just like to emphasize that COVID does affect young people as well as old people. I think there's a misconception that because we're young, we are, we're not, going to be hit by COVID as hard as someone else would. Um, speaking from personal experience, my best friend had COVID at the time she was 18, very healthy, and she had to go to the hospital because she couldn't breathe on her own and she almost died. It's probably one of the hardest things I've ever been through. And I know many of us have personal experiences with COVID as well. They might not have personal experiences with friends who have had COVID. And so passing this is something that would help people who don't know how they're gonna to react to it because you don't. You're never gonna know how you're gonna to react to COVID until you get it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Neely, Representative Dibler. 
just um, a lot of the points that I was going to make have already been addressed, but, and is this, would, would this, uh, Najee, would this, uh, sorry, um, Chair Rodriguez, would this be the uh, correct time to propose an amendment to the resolution? That is correct, yes. Um, I would then propose a resolution to amend the phrase mandatory or mandate to rec or highly encourage or heavily recommend. It, it is accepted as unfriendly um, by the co-sponsors. Um, that being said, Representative Deibler, do you rescind your amendment or do you, you oppose and do you want that up for a vote? I would like that up for a vote. Okay, and there will now be, we'll move on to discussion of the motion um, that has been made for the amendment. Is there a second? There is a second, meaning we will move into discussion on the amendment that was proposed. Please all lower your hands if you were in the queue for discussion on the original. And we will now move into discussion on the amendment. Um, there's been a request um, by Representative Zhang to have the amendment typed out. Representative Deibler, do you mind typing out the amendment in the Zoom chat so that the Speaker Gibbard can edit that and post that within? Uh, sure thing. Give me one moment. Thank you. Okay, now that that's been added, I will be now making um, the Zoom poll um, and we will be going into discussion on the amendment. Um, Representative Round Sorensen, you are the first name on my queue. Well, okay, Representative Round Sorensen, I just want to say that, like, th if we change that, then that completely changes, like, this resolution. You could have just voted, you can just vote no on this, and it won't pass. Um, like, we don't have to change the name of it, like, to get it, like, whatever, like, this doesn't have to pass through assembly. We cannot do this amendment and you can just vote no, and then it won't pass. But what this does is this completely changes the nature of this resolution. It changes the nature, like the nature of the situation would have to be changed. The RCA would have to be changed. Like it would be a completely different resolution. And so I would recommend if you don't like, if you don't like this resolution as it stands, I would just vote no, because then nothing, if this like, if we write this now and like this fails, whatever, like it can, nothing like it can ever come through again. And so I would vote no on this right now if we changed the title and I'm a co-sponsor, I would vote no on this because the university already has strongly recommended it. And so what we're here to do is advocate for something that the university is already isn't doing. Like they're not doing this. And so we're saying, the people who support this resolution are saying, we want you to do this. They don't have to do it. This, like, there's no guaranteeing that they will even like respond to this, whatever. But like, that just completely changes it. And I would like, I think that we should vote no on this amendment or like, I don't know if it can be rescinded, but like, it just completely changes it. Like, it, I, I don't know. I don't see a point to this amendment when you could just vote no. Okay. Um, and thank you, Representative Ron Sorensen. Um, and again, just a reminder to everyone, please just exclusively address the chair. There is a motion to end discussion on the amendment. Is there any opposition to that? Okay, seeing none, I'll take that as general consensus and we'll now move into a vote on the amendment. I'll be releasing the poll momentarily. Please hold as I do so.
Okay, the poll has been launched. Please make your vote on the amendment. Yes is to add the amendment that is there. No is to vote against the amendment. Point of, is there. Point of why it, I, I don't know what this is, but we can't even vote. Most yeah. panelists cannot vote. It's also All multiple right. choice. That is <laughs> you can pick my like fault. One, one second. One. That was the first Zoom poll that I've ever done. One second, everybody. Uh, point of inquiry, just for some representatives for information. Yes, Speaker Gibbard. Um, can you just re-explain the vote? Because I, some, I know a couple people are confused about what exactly they're voting on right now. Yes. Uh, okay, so a vote yes will be to approve the amendment that Representative Dibler has stated, which is heavily encouraged, and then changing to recommendations instead of requirements. If you vote no, that is against the amendment that has been made by Representative Dibler, meaning it's gonna revert back to its original language. And a vote to abstain is if you were not a part of the conversation at all, which you should have been. And just for context, I'm editing the poll. Um, again, sorry for the technical difficulties. That was the first Zoom poll that we've done. Um, I'll be sure to ensure that that is cohesive next time. Hi everyone, sorry I'm interjecting. Um, Najee is gonna send you guys a Microsoft Teams form, uh, just so you guys know, hang in tight. Sorry about the delay. This might be a little late, but can I motion to vote by roll call? I feel bad for Najee, but I would second that. <laughs> like, if you guys just made that. Yes, I just, we just need to vote on this and then we can go back to original discussion, but we're on discussion on the amendment. But we can get to that um, once this is finalized. I meant if vote by roll call on the amendment. He already sent out the form. Oh, voting's already started. Never mind. That is true. Voting has commenced. I do apologize oh, for that. Sorry. I didn't get. No, it's, it's totally fine. I apologize for that. Um, but again, please refer to the teams um, and please vote on that amendment. Again, vote yes is to adopt Representative Dibler's language on ensuring that it is a recommendation. A vote no is to revert it back to the original language as stated. And thank you for your patience. Again, we did run into some technical difficulties with that. Um, that will not happen again. Again, just for final clarification, the team's um, poll has been sent within the teams on voting on the amendment. Please be sure to vote on that. We are, I believe, on route to be at the number that we should be um, based on attendance. But again, please refer to the teams. If you are confused, I know I did receive a few texts, but it is on teams and please vote for Representative Dibler's amendment in the teams. We have reached the number that was stated in attendance. The amendment proposed by Representative Dibler fails.
We will now move into original discussion on the resolution. Please raise your hands if you do have points of discussion to address for the original resolution. I will begin with what I see on my queue, beginning with Representative DeAngelis. Hey everyone, Representative DeAngelis at large. Um, I just wanna like preface that like, um, it is like a, like, I understand the um, personal side that this definitely has for everyone. Um, it is something that is serious and it does matter with life and death. It is something that um, is a very serious issue and that was stated. However, you have to see the side of people to where it is not FDA approved and it is someone's body. And some representative did mention before that um, you can't really, uh, you can't really like make this decision for someone when it is their health and their um, like own body and mandating something, especially just from a UPA standpoint uh, that they have to get this before it is even FDA approved does bring up some type of um, moral and ethical questions that I think may even be beyond what we should be probably discussing. Um, and uh, if we were to vote on this, I feel like it would be in, as representatives, our best interest to either wait until it is FDA approved or um, have a student poll sent out to the bo student body because it is something that does concern um, like the entire student population. So I don't know if I would feel comfortable uh, voicing my opinion when I don't know the opinion of the constituents that we are serving. All right, thank you, Representative DeAngelis. Um, Representative Ron Sorensen, I just wanna make note that this will be your second time speaking. Yeah, I just also, I just wanted to speak to like, um, I know that I talked about like the person, my like personal feelings first, like about the vaccine and how I was afraid that I was gonna die when I came down to Penn State when um, that, so I won't like talk about that again, but I would like to now talk about um, how a lot, of, I feel like it's a common denominator with all students that we want things to go back to normal. We want football season back. We want to be in the BJC for basketball games. We want to go to we want to go to hockey games. Um, a lot of us are going into our senior years. We want to have fun. We want to have UPA meetings in person. We want to have our RSO meetings in person. Uh, we want to be able to eat with our friends and in, in the dining halls. We want to be able to not have to wear a mask every single place that we go. That's masks are like a far further away thing, but like with like new CDC guidelines with outdoor activities things are a lot more lenient now uh, with people who are vaccinated. And so this is that return to normalcy that people have been begging for, for over a year, including when we were in the 15th assembly talking about closing the university again, people were saying, we just want things to go back to normal. This is what's good for our mental health. So based on my previous experience where students were polled then, um, Representative Reynolds did a very serious poll uh, like survey. It was very extensive and comprehensive. And like the largest thing is mental health. Like we were concerned about mental health last assembly. And so I think that a lot of the same concerns are being echoed right now and like I feel like that might be people's reservations is like hey like yeah we don't it's not 100% FDA approved well it's not like I don't it took forever for dorms to be collective living spaces and so like they weren't eligible for vaccines but nursing homes could so it's like the CDC and the FDA aren't always like hitting the nail on the head with everything and like I don't mean to say like that they shouldn't be trusted, but, and like, we're not doctors, we're not scientists, but I feel like we can just like use some common sense that we've gathered from the past year. And um, to like, yeah, just common sense and logic. Like this makes sense. If we want things to go back to normal, we mandate vaccines for people living on campus. That's how we make professors safe. That's how we make RAs safe. That's how we make our peers safe. That's how like we make things safe again. That's how we go back to normal. That's like, I see all these things about, oh, like, let me, like, I just want to take my mask off. Like, I just want to go back to normal. But it's like from people who aren't vaccinated. And it's like, in order to go back to that normal, you have to be vaccinated. And so this just sends a message to the student body that we are saying, we want things to go back to normal too. We want you to be healthy. Like, this is public health. And so I don't know, like, 
I definitely get like the drawbacks to like, yeah, it's not 100% like normal FDA approved right now, but like, why like this, like this is an emergency. Like this is a, this has been a national, like a worldwide emergency for over a year now. And so like, we have a solution to this problem. So I don't understand why when UPA was all about like pushing things forward to like make us like whatever be like have people on campus. Now we're not going to make it safer for people to be on campus. I feel like that's contradictory and hypocritical for us to not pass something like this after saying all these things about going back to normal for a year. All right, Representative Terry. Hi, Sean Terry at large. I just wanted to clarify because I did not mention this in my last, the last time I spoke. Um, I, I am going to vote yes on this resolution, whether or not there is an amendment due to the whole FDA approved. I think that the likelihood that there are side effects in regards to the vaccine gets smaller and smaller every day that more and more people get vaccinated. That being said, the, the long-term risks we do not know anything about and this this has this is a new product on the market. Um, I, I, again, I, I would say if anybody is concerned and feels like they need to do that, please put forward an amendment to do so, so we can stop having discussion about it and we can sort of add that in or or reject that notion. Um, but I would say if it is important to you, um, just put that forward. I, but I, I just want everyone to know I will be voting in favor. I think this is the right thing to do. Getting everybody vaccinated on campus is really important to stop the spread of the virus. It's been proven that it both stops transmission and severe illness. Uh, and I do want to make sure that everybody is aware of where I stand on that issue. All right, I am going to state if from discussion on here on out, if we can just refrain from the chat and just exclusively focus on um, discussion at this point, I am hearing new points being brought up. I'm, I'm still sensing disagreement. You of course may um, call for your own motions, but I will allow the continued discussion unless otherwise decided upon by a representative um, to address these new points. Um, but I will go to Representative Gangle. Representative Gangle at large. Um, I just want to state that I've been working alongside um, Dr. Joshua Weedy, uh, part of the College of Liberal Arts, um, on a student task force that works directly with Team G, which is the COVID um, response team for faculty. And uh, what I've talked to, to about with him and along with other faculty members is the fact that students who are not able to come back to campus, whether that be because they have health issues or other related issues, maybe autoimmune things, asthma, et cetera, who aren't able to come back to campus campus in the fall because of worries that full, we're going to be at full capacity, they're required to do a uh, temporary transfer to world campus. So anybody, I don't know if you, if anybody knows this, but any student who's coming in for this next year or is currently a student and cannot come back in the fall, they will have to do a transfer of campus to world campus. And from looking at it from my perspective, I don't think it's fair to be like, oh, you have a mental health or excuse me, a illness that you can't help, an autoimmune disease, whatever it might be, that you can't help and you're penalized by going to world campus. Uh, when there are students who could be getting vaccinated, who could help protect these people. And I think requiring someone to get a vaccine, which is their choice, would help pr protect students who are required to go to world campus and who are being penalized for things that they are out of their control completely. Um, another point that I'd like to bring up is along with talking to the faculty uh, advisory board on COVID, uh, a lot of faculty do not feel comfortable teaching at full capacity in the fall. I think that's important to note, considering that our education is dependent on the faculty that are at University Park. And if we're not putting this required vaccine in place, there will be a lot of professors who fear for their health and fear for the safety of their families, um, especially considering that they are an older demographic. So yes, well, you know, us as middle, uh, as young age students aren't at that much of a risk. There are faculty members here who are who are senior citizens who are a high risk factor and can be put at risk if we do not implement this. I'm in full support of this. I think this is something that needs to be put it put through because we need to set an example for the university uh, just like Rutgers has. And I think if we could be one of the first schools to do this, that, that would set a really good precedent for other schools across the nation. That was exactly two minutes. Thank you, Representative Gangle. Representative Robertson. Noah Robertson, College of the Liberal Arts. Um, so is hi, a, everyone. Sorry, there is a point of inquiry. Um, is I Penn State, I'll read it. 
for everyone, is Penn State offering hybrid remote as an option or are students either full back in person or world campus? I, I Representative can Gingle? Yes, I can okay. Um So basically, um, there's going to be no hybrid option. Um, they will directly have to go to world campus if they cannot come back to full capacity in person, which means they'll either have to be living downtown in an apartment or living on campus to be a University Park student or any of the uh, satellites, Harrisburg, et cetera. Um, if they aren't capable of coming back for whatever that re reason may be, uh, they will be required to transfer to World Campus where they only offer asynchronous classes. Um, there's no, cl there's few limited clubs and organizations on there. They also will not have access to Penn State Healthcare. So any student who's currently on Penn State Healthcare or any incoming freshman who needs Penn State Healthcare will not be able to access that because World Campus students do not have access to UHS, uh, Penn State Healthcare, excuse me. Uh, and another thing to note is the fact that um, students will also, um, who are in the Shriers Honors College, there's no honors classes offered through World Campus. So those students who have required honors requirements to fulfill during their time at Penn State will not be able to fulfill those. Um, so just to answer that question. And time has been yielded to President Bose to also add supplemental information to that question. Hi, I just wanted to add um, some additional information too. So for University Park students that um, can't return to campus for either health reasons or even international students that might be facing travel bans, there is now that raise, hand, raise your hand function within Starfish um, that alerts advisors and um, can, can brings advisors to those students to help find some of those web options within University Park system um, or other different types of, of ways that they can kind of work around and, and try and stay at University Park. So I, I did wanna add that just to supplemental information to add uh, additional context to the conversation. Thank you. Um, Representative Robertson, you may continue. I apologize. That's okay. Hi everyone, Noah Robertson, College of Liberal Arts. Um, want to apologize for earlier. I wasn't feeling well and I had to step away from the meeting uh, during the intro and the questions, um, but I'm back now. And on the previous question that we just voted on, um, I want to share that I think that it's really important to require rather than um, strongly encourage the vaccine. And the reason why I wrote and fully support this resolution um, because of that reasoning of other universities of similar scale like Rutgers, um, they've said simply encouraging the vaccine will not have the same effect as requiring it. Um, and other universities have upheld similar philosophies. Uh, what this resolution really seeks to do, um, you know, as representatives of the undergraduate student body is to uh, state the student body opinion that given a reevaluation of the decision to encourage versus incentivize versus require a vaccine, we would prefer a vaccine requirement to not only protect our health as members of the Penn State community, but also to prevent COVID from spreading to the surrounding community. Um, that's really important to me. We also want to recognize that students may have, you know, those many valid and serious concerns for not wanting or being able to receive the vaccine, uh, which we addressed in the RCA. Uh, so, you know, we ask that in the case of a COVID-19 vaccine requirement, Penn State should provide some flexibility uh, for those students to ensure equity throughout the transition process. Um, and I, I just want to thank you for your time considering this. I hope this resolution has your support. And also say that as the primary author of the resolution, I can also stand for questions if the chair would allow. Um, that might be best directed towards me as like the person who authored it. I, again, I'm sorry I missed the initial discussion. I kind of had something I was dealing with. Thank you, Representative Robertson. Um, I will say that we will just limit it to discussion for now. Um, and that being said, we will move to Representative Federal. Hi, Aaliyah Federal, Panhall Rep. So I was born and raised in this area, so I've definitely seen just how much Penn State has affected the community regarding COVID. Like my parents live 15 minutes away from here. They are terrified to even come to Walmart to get their groceries because of the students. Um, my sister's school was shut down. So like my high school, it wasn't, state, it wasn't state high, but it was Penns Valley. It was shut down for two weeks because of people coming into contact with Penn State students. And my um, sister's best friend's father and actually both of her parents are um, cops for both the university and for downtown State College. And they are terrified to even go to their jobs because of how the students just neglect any of the COVID rules. So I feel that this is super important to require students and not just recommend it 
because it's affecting the entire county. Like, I don't think the students realize that and they need to because my parents should be able to just go to Walmart, walk in the store and get their groceries. And my sister should be able to go to school and see her friends every day. She's stuck at home now because of Penn State. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Representative Federoff. Um, I'm going to pause and I will ask that you refer to the teams to vote um, on whether or not you have made up your mind on the resolution. I want to see that to indicate where we currently stand and whether or not to close the floor for discussion. There has been extensive um, discussion already that has covered a variety of points. Please vote on that so I know where we currently stand on the issue um, and we can proceed from there. Thank you. Again, that's just a quick click to the teams. Please vote on where you currently stand. Um, okay, so we, there's overwhelming majority of those who have already made up their mind on the resolution for full transparency, that's 32 to 4. Um, I'm now going to close the floor for discussion. You, of course, can appeal. Okay, so there has been a motion to vote for roll call. Um, that is the prerogative of the chair and also um, the, as stipulated in the bylaws and constitution. Um, and there is a second. Is there any discussion on that motion? Or I'm sorry, there can't be discussion on that motion. My apologies. Um, so, no, we cannot, Representative Impovito. I apologize for that. We are now um, in that motion already. Okay, so we're going to vote by roll call, Secretary Campos. Uh, Arthi Kalor. Yes. Aliyah Federoff? Yes. Amory Round Sorensen? Yes. Brandon Walker? Kara Flygel? Yes. Carter Gangle? Yes. Kathy Zhao? David Morgan? Yes. Donald and Pavito? No. Emmanuel Almonte? Yes. Hope Steger? No. Holden Ingalls? Jasmine Bolduck? Yes. Jason Nelson? Janelle Luazo? Yes. Jordan Diebler? No. George Durango Espen? Yes. Joshua Reynolds? No. Caitlin Farrar? No. Kyle Quinn? No. Lakin Meter? Yes. Lewis Richardson? Yes. Marie Missner? Yes. Marissa Gillespie? 
No. Matthew DeAngelis? No. Megan Neely? Yes. Michael DeBoten? Michael Jablonski? Yes. Noah Robertson? Yes. Patricia Barungi? Yes. Raina Alexander? Yes. Refugio Lara? Yes. Ryan Lascalzo? Yes. Samantha Brown? No. Samuel Aja? Yes. Sean Terry? Yes. Selena Go? Yes. Seth Constein? No. Steven Zhang? Yes. Sydney Gibbard? Um, I'm abstaining, and I think I'm allowed to explain why I'm abstaining. Um, like in the past, when we order things from Starbucks and stuff like that, Starbucks employees abstain, and I'm technically an employee of Johnson Johnson. So, yeah, thanks. Please hold as we consult with the secretary on the vote count. We'll be with you momentarily on that. Thank you, Secretary Campos. Resolution 0416, supporting a COVID-19 vaccine requirement for the 2021-2022 academic year at Penn State University of Park um, passes with a vote of 25, 10 to one. Um, before we proceed with um, our agenda, I will just state that while meetings can be contentious, um, do not hold it against one another for how they are, vote how they are voted upon. Again, I just wanna keep that in mind as we proceed, every representative is entitled to their opinion on the floor. Um, and again, I want to express that. Um, given that we, Jordan Zaya is not available for a chief justice report, we will now move into executive reports. That being said, are there any executive, oh, Speaker Gibber does have the report. Okay, we're gonna revert back to that. Um, we'll now hear a report from Chief Justice Zaya um, from Speaker Gibber. Um, yeah, so Jordan says, Hi everyone, my apologies for not being able to make it today. I would like to congratulate the justices on being reconfirmed and I'm looking forward to working with you all for another year. Just as an update, our associate justice applications are closed on Saturday. We had seven applicants for four justice positions. President Bose and I interviewed the candidates on Monday and earlier on Wednesday and their confirmation should be coming to the floor during the summer assembly meeting. Good luck on finals to everyone. Thank you, Speaker Gibbard. And given that Chief Justice Zaya is not here to answer any questions, we'll now move into executive reports. Are there any executive reports? If so, please raise your hand. Chief of Staff Jordan. Hi, everyone. Um, happy Wednesday. Just a few things for me. Um, so we submitted the office swipe form, so you should all be getting swiped soon. I'll email when that's clear. Um, but uh, another thing, um, as you can see in our Teams channel, um, there's a team created for every single committee as well as like opportunity external events. Um, make sure you turn on the notifications for each individual channel that you are a part of um, because then you'll be able to see the updates. Um, and for example, if you're not single one committee, you don't need to turn them on because it's not relevant to you, um, but you can still see it if you want to browse. Um, I had a meeting with the team's rep last week and it was really informative. So I will be adding more to that. I'm also giving a tutorial as time goes on of kind of how to um, use it more. For those who aren't familiar with it, let me know and I can help you out. Um, and then lastly, I'm excited to get um, our executive department meetings um, up and running. So that's really exciting. Um, but with that, I'll stand for any questions. Good luck on your finals. We're in the home stretch. Thank you, Chief of Staff Jordan. Are there any questions for Chief of Staff Jordan? Okay. 
Seeing none, we will now move into the speaker report. We will now hear a report by Speaker Gibbard. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, thank you for sticking it out for another kind of long um, assembly meeting, um, but this should be the last like super long one. Um, um, as we move into the fall and it's more just based on legislation, not um, like policies or um, like elections or anything. Um, but my report, I just wanted to say definitely please sign up for one on ones. Um, the, all the dates now are for after finals. Um, I know some people have their plans still up in the air, so I won't like reach out to everyone individually to schedule one until after finals. Um, but I've had about 15 one on ones with reps so far, and I've really enjoyed them like getting to know you guys a little bit better one on one. Um, and I feel like I'm Coming friends with you all on Zoom, um, which is really fun. Um, I've also had um, the chance to attend all the first committee meetings over the past week, except for facilities, sadly, but I heard it went great. And congratulations to all the chairs for hosting your first meeting and to the vice chairs for their election. Um, uh, last week, I attended the first meeting of the search committee for the new associate vice president of undergraduate education, and we received like all the charges, um, and there will be interviews throughout the summer, and they might actually be doing some in-person ones, which is exciting. Um, I'll skip through a bunch of things, but I just definitely wanted to say that on Sunday, we assigned all the representatives th to their committees. I reached out to about half of you that were either sitting on three committees or only one committee, or I just wanted to clarify something with you. Um, so thank you for your responses on that. And I'll be sending out a finalized list within the coming days. Um, you probably heard from your chairs about whether or not, um, like what committees you're sitting on already, if they sent out a message to you. Um, and. I also attended faculty senate this past Tuesday. Um, it was really interesting. I, um, the education committee got to talk a little bit about how we can include equity within our committee moving forward um, and make that one of our main charges for um, 2021 to 2022. Um, other than that, please reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns. Um, have a great summer and go kill it on your finals. Thank you, Speaker Gibbard. Are there any questions for Speaker Gibbard? Representative Lascalzo. Uh, Ryan Lascalzo, Lion Pride representative. <clears throat> this is about the uh, summer assembly meeting. Um, I was just wondering, because I just heard about that tonight and all, if you as leader of the, as speaker of the assembly have any more information of like when you are planning on having that and what will exactly will be on the agenda for that meeting, just some general information. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that we'll be making this decision more collaboration with um, Vice President Rodriguez and um, President Bose. I know that we definitely want to give everyone a break. I believe that you don't just deserve a break from school, but also from student orgs as well. Um, so we'll probably, it will probably be between like middle of June to middle of July. I know it says one week in advance in the bylaws, but we'll definitely reach out like way, way ahead of time to make sure that we will have quorum too as well. Um, I'm assuming that most of our legislation will be like related to, um, I know one big thing that people try and do before the school year is like red zone action week. And if we're planning on passing any bills or any legislation, um, because that's usually hosted within the first week or two of school. Um, also, if there's anything like COVID pertinent as far as moving back into person and any conversations that we've had with offices and how UPA can support that. Um, but yeah, I don't know if, I hope that kind of answered your question. Thank you, Representative Scalzo. Are there any further questions for Representative or Speaker Gibbard? Um, Najee, sorry, can I make one more thing? Yes, and then we'll go to I Representative Terry. A motion to suspend the budget right now. Is there a second? Thank you. Okay, Sean has a question for me. Okay, Representative Terry. Hi, I just wanted to ask, um, is there going to be like a mandatory attendance policy to that as well or because I know that the people are busy during the summer I know that I personally have like a full-time internship going on and I just want to make sure like I'm not missing anything if we are needed but also if there's like a plan to like schedule at a time that everybody can meet together because I just know everyone's schedules are so different yeah, so quorum is two thirds of all representatives. So we'll need um, to have at least two thirds of representatives in, present in voting. Um, I also have a full time internship. So I, I understand that. And like, I respect that for a lot of people who are busy working this summer. And that's why we want to communicate as early as possible when that date will be. Um, we might even propose a couple different possible dates and whatever works best for people as far as like planning in advance. Um, I 
I was pretty lenient this week because I know it's the week before finals week as I will be um, over the summer with if people have things come up um, as far as like not being able to attend things um, because of either family obligations or traveling and I want to be respectful of that as well. Um, so I will like definitely approach it with leniency. I will say that it's mandatory, but that's kind of my answer to that. Are there any other questions for Speaker Gibbard? Seeing none, we will now move into hearing comments from the chair of the committees. We'll begin with academic affairs with Chair Richardson. Howdy, everyone. Uh, you can see most of my updates in my report to the assembly underneath the agenda. Um, I'll generally, this is how these reports are going to go. I'm going to direct you there because I try and be thorough there. Um, aside from that, we will not be having committee this week. Uh, we will more than likely be having it after finals week. Uh, seeing as how we are academic affairs, I figured it would be fitting for us to take finals week off. Um, yeah, aside from that, just be on the lookout for some correspondence from myself and uh, Noah. And if you are a member of academic affairs, please see the email that we sent, uh, or that Representative Robertson or Vice Chair Robertson sent. Um, it has links to the uh, group me, as well as be on the lookout for being added to the teams that should be happening by the end of this week. Thank you, Chair Richardson. Are there any questions for Chair Richardson? Seeing none, we will now move on to facilities with Chair Flegel. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to keep this short. Facilities committee is going to be tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, if you're in facilities, please make sure that you filled out the weekly update form. The link can be found in the facilities team channel um, in the assembly report that Sydney sent out with the agenda. And then I'll also be sending it into the group me as well. Reminder that April 29th, 6.30 p.m. is Night of Remembrance. This is a candlelit Virgil on Old Main Lawn, which is honoring students who have passed away. Please consider going. As always, you're here to be a student first. I know that finals are really stressful for everyone. So just please make sure that you're looking out for yourself and each other and your guys are like getting prepared for finals well. Um, please never hesitate to reach out. Everyone have a great night. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Chair Flegel. Are there any questions for Chair Flegel? Okay, seeing none, we'll now move on to a report from the Committee on Governmental Affairs with Chair Meter. Hi everyone, um, same with everyone else. You can view a lot of my um, report in the meeting agenda. Um, Gov Affairs met yesterday um, and we passed the resolution in support of the double pill campaign. So thank you to everyone for voting to pass that. Um, I'm meeting with members for two on one. So if you haven't signed up for two on ones, please be sure to do so. Um, I've also began meeting with a lot of our contacts in the OGCR. Um, I have a meeting with Tim Balliot coming up. Um, as well as some of our other contacts. Um, on another note, I will be going on a tour of the Belisario Media Center, the new media center that they're opening up, along with the new College of Com representative, Michael DeBotten, um, because I was the College of Com representative this past assembly. Um, so if you have any questions about what that looks like, when that plans to be fully open after I tour it, feel free to reach out to me. Um, other than that, um, have a great summer. Good luck with finals if you ever need me. Um, my number is included in the meeting um, agenda as well as on all the contact lists. So thank you guys. Thank you, Chair Meter. Are there any questions for Chair Meter? Seeing none, we'll now move on to a report from the Committee on Justice and Equity with Chair Kaler. Hi, everyone. Um, first and foremost, thank you to everyone who showed up to JE last Friday. Really appreciated it. And congratulations to Raina Alexander for being the new vice chair of JE. Um, in terms of our meeting this week, a lot some of you guys have said that this Friday might be a little difficult. So I decided to push our meeting to after finals. So it will it will most likely be the week of May 10th. So please be on the lookout for a doodle poll. Um, just a reminder that attendance will be mandatory for that. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll, we'll be going over initiatives. I'll try to keep it as quick and as efficient as possible. Um, because I'm canceling committee, um, and I know most of you are free at 4.30, um, I really hope to see you at the Power to the People rally and march um, at 5 p.m. this Friday. It will. Oh wait, not not 5 p.m. 4 p.m. this Friday, and it will begin at Beaver Stadium. So, 
please come out. Please reach out to me if you would like to meet up and go together. I think it would be a really great experience. Um, and then, yeah, other than that, good luck on finals and have a great summer. Thank you. There is a motion to extend the meeting to 11. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, all right, Chair. Okay, so there is a second. All right, so we will now move on to um, the Committee on Student Life with Chair Brown. Chair Brown. Um, hello, everyone. I see Ryan really didn't want to hear my report, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, okay, first, congratulations to Vice Chair Seeger. I'm so excited to work with you. Um, Student Life, Sunday, 11 a.m., Get ready, get excited. We will be discussing initiatives and then um, I don't want to sign or anything like that until after finals and we can like figure that out over the summer so everyone knows what they're doing. And most important night of remembrance is tomorrow. I will be there at six helping out. If anyone on Student Life is free and wants to help out, please, please text me. Otherwise, Old Main 630, rain or shine. This is an amazing event. And I think it's really important that if you are available to come, that you do come. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and good luck on finals. Hashtag Student Life Thriving. Are there any questions for Chair Brown? Seeing none, we will now move into comments for the good of the order. Are there any comments for the good of the order? If so, please raise your hand. All right, Representative Reynolds. Commissioner Reynolds at large. I wanted to say when I first came in, I thought I was pretty preset on the vote regarding mandatory vaccination, but there were some really good points raised that I had not quite considered uh, regarding the students who would be forced to attend world campus because they themselves might not be able to get vaccinated regarding uh, student workers and professors uh, i thought those were all very strong points and i was disappointed that we ended discussion even though most people had made up their minds um, we did not actually vote as an assembly whether to end discussion we just said whether or not we were uh, already decided and given that there were so many fresh and new points and a lack of redundancies getting raised, uh, I know I myself was really on the fence with that uh, vote. And I thought it would have been nice to be able to hear out some more of the other ideas. And I know I had a question that I did not get to ask at the time because I didn't know quite whether it would count as a question or discussion, but regarding any studies done so far regarding the effect of vaccination preventing uh, the spread, the transmission of COVID, because I thought that that particular point was not quite as demonstrated in the resolution, and that could have really bolstered the arguments regarding world campus and such. So I, in, in future, would, would much prefer if we do end up as a committee voting whether or not we are ready to end the discussion, since both sides still had so many fresh uh, and thoughtful points, and I know some people had prepared statements that they never got to read, but thank you. Yeah, and due to that being a question of procedure, I just want to step in and clarify. Um, again, it is the chair's prerogative um, within the governing documents to close discussion. I want to be transparent with that. Um, as done with former Pre uh, Vice President Pathical, there is a more formal way to do this in person. However, we are online, so there are certain restrictions. Um, she used a poll. Um, I'm using precedent to use polls in regards to seeing where everyone stands on the issue as to not waste um, any further time and ensure that there is an efficient meeting. Um, of course, I want to extend the option to all. You are more than willing to be able to motion to appeal um, my, my ruling that is there for you to use as a resource. Um, I felt very comfortable with the margins that were present with that to, of course, continue um, and end discussion and vote based on what was stated. I um, mean, I do apologize if any representatives feel slighted or if, uh, if any representatives did not feel like they were able to express um, their thoughts properly. Um, but I did just want to step in in terms of the procedural um, side of things. Um, Representative Lascalzo. Uh, Ryan Lascalzo, Lion Pride representative. Um, I just wanted to say that was it the um, Penn State's personal uh, uh, LGBTQI plus Pride Month is coming to an end this month. 
I hope you guys were able to attend activities that were advertised through the Center for Sexual and Gender Diversity. Um, Lion Pride itself, we re-elected, we not re-elected, we elected a new executive board. Uh, so we're gonna be all ready for the new year. Uh, also as a part of my personal thing when I ran for uh, this position, I really want to uh, not only connect my uh, constituents to other representatives, but I want to connect uh, LGBTQI pl QIA plus representatives with each other. So if you are a member of the EPUA and you are a part of that community, feel free to reach out to me or have me reach out to you, whatever works up for you. So I just want to make sure that we are there, have a good, uh, com uh, not conversation, good uh, dialogue and are able to uh, be uh, friends and all be uh, like unified together in friendship and community. Thank you. Thank you for representative, thank you representative Lascalzo. Uh, I do wanna address a point that was made in the chat. Comments for the good of the order are only for representatives. Um, all right, representative uh, Dibler. Uh, hi everyone, Representative Jordan Dibor at large. Um, I know Waken just mentioned, or sorry, uh, Chair Meter just rep or said it earlier. Uh, I am now the federal state liaison, and I'm just kind of saying if you guys have any sort of federal or state contacts that you can get me in touch with uh, to make my job uh, not just easier, but more effective and more efficient, please do so. We can definitely look at trying to advocate for the passing of that double Pell grant. Um, and besides that, good luck in your finals, everyone. You're going to crush them. Good job. Thank you, Representative Dibler. Representative Luazo. Hi, Representative Luazo uh, Black Caucus. This is the last time you'll be hearing this from me, but two days left of now more than ever week. The Black Caucus team has been working super hard on it. Tomorrow we have a Sankofa, which is a discussion and that is hosted by Penn State alumni and we'll be discussing the events in advocacy that went down in 2001. And if you're at the hub between the hours of Thursday 8 p.m. through Friday 8 a.m. Can't say what's going on, but be there. And then Friday, Friday, there's no other place you should be than at Beaver Stadium at four o'clock for our march and rally. Again, like Chair Cole mentioned earlier, we'll be walk, walking from Beaver Stadium all the way to um, Old Main. There will be speeches, poems, talks, whatever there's going to be there. I really hope hope you guys all make it, especially if you're at you're on campus. And yeah, have a great summer, guys. Thank you, Representative Loazzo. Representative Brown or Chair Brown. Hi, Samantha Brown at large. Um, okay. Thank you, Barry, for pointing this out. You it is in the policies or policy somewhere that you cannot have committee past 8 a.m. on Saturday of finals week. So I will be canceling student life committee for this week and um, rescheduling after finals week. I will keep you updated in the group me, in the teams. And if you have any questions, please reach out. So sorry for the confusion. Thank you, Chair Brown, Representative Meet, uh, sorry, Chair Meter. Hey everyone, here's just a reminder that the deadline to register to vote for the municipal primary elections is May 3rd. Um, the deadline to submit your mail-in ballot is May 11th. A lot of you will be going home during that time and will not be able to vote here at your voting location. So if that is the case for you, please make sure that you that the voting office has to receive your application by May 11th. So that means submit it before that. Um, and then primary elections will be on May 18th. I just sent something in the chat. It's a link to um, requesting your mail-in ballot. Um, I will be making graphics hopefully tomorrow about these deadlines. Um, so if you'd like to help me do that, I'm really not good at making graphics. So feel free to help, um, but make sure that if you're not registered to vote in your hometown that you are registered here and get a mail-in ballot if you need so. Um, if you have any questions about how to do that, reach out to me. Thank you, Chair Meter. Representative Constantine. Hi guys, uh, Seth Constantine at large. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick like explanation as to why I voted no during the uh, the the 
COVID vaccine requirement. Um, I had a, a point that I wanted to make um, about, which is it's perfectly okay, but I had a point that I wanted to make about um, checking with the students before we did this requirement um, and give a quick explanation as to why I voted no. When this came out today, I kind of did like some really bad surveying, but I, I texted in like group me chats or whatever, and I put it out there. I was like, what do you guys feel about this? I happened to be in the hub and I, I walked past some people and I just asked them what they thought about it. And I got really conflicting answers. Um, so as like the representative student body, I would have preferred to check with the student body or a representative for the student body. So I would have preferred to check with them before voting. If it came back overwhelmingly yes for that, I would have voted yes. But I just wanted to give a quick explanation as to why I voted no on that. Thank you, Representative Konstein. Uh, Representative DeAngelis. Hey guys, so I just wanted to um, hop on here really quick and uh, just um, give some context about what's going on with uh, ABTS really quick. Um, so just, we did have a, obviously very contentious um, discussion about what happened today. So, um, and like what we passed. So if anyone's interested, I will be um, asking like around for, like other uh, big 10 schools, like what their plans are. Um, if anyone's interested at looking over that legislation, once I do get it, um, feel, please feel free to reach out. Um, I can definitely update um, anyone on that type of thing. But I think that since it is such a big issue um, that it is important to reach out to other schools. So um, yeah, just if you guys wanna know more about it or anything like that, just feel free to reach out and we can uh, see what all of our friends across the country are doing. So thank you. Representative Impavita. Yeah, so I just wanted to give an explanation to why I also voted no tonight. Uh, personally, I was more on board with what the actual decision was for the ruling, but I wanted to voice my opinion on it and I wanted to table it because uh, I thought more time should have been done to research um, and get student opinions from the College of IST because I wasn't able to do that a whole lot. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Representative Impavito, Representative Robertson. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to quick jump in and explain a little bit why I brought it by two thirds um, today, uh, mostly because uh, I got a chance to sit through faculty senate yesterday um, and President Barron addressed the Senate and talked about the timeline by which they're considering swapping from incentives to encouragements to like requirements. Um, and he said that that would happen in July and that the university is thinking about it across lots of different leadership teams. Um, but this is the last UPUA assembly meeting before that would have happened. Otherwise, I really would have preferred to bring it through committee and get discussion done there. Uh, but I hope that provides a little bit of insight into the timeline of the resolution. Thank you, Representative Robertson. All I would add to comments for the good of the order is that I will be in the UPUA office this Friday at 3.30. Um, if anyone has interest in walking over to the stadium um, to, of course, attend the rally slash march, um, just, of course, I'll send something in the group me if you are on campus. And if so, um, we can walk together if you'd like. Um, Chief of Staff Jordan. Sorry, I have one more thing to add. Um, the Chanel Miller books are in the office as well. Um, so people have been here all week. Um, there's also right outside the office um, a table with some handful of books. But if someone um, ask you where they are, just tell them 314 Hub. And if they need like a special time or us to reserve one for them, um, just you can just give them my email or my phone number and I can figure out a time to help them pick it up. I'm um, sorry I forgot to add that, but there's a lot of books here. So even if you want one, um, come pick one up, we'll be here. Seeing no other comments for the good of the order, uh, Secretary Campos, will you please take closing roll call? Aaron Bowes. Here. Najee Rodriguez. Arthi Kalor. Here. Alea Fedorov. Anne Marie Round Sorensen. Here. Brandon Walker. Here. Kara Flegel. Here. Carter Gangle. Here. Kathy Zhao. Here. David Morgan. Here. Donald Impavito. Here. Emmanuel Monte. Here. Hope Steger. Here. Holden Ingalls. Jasmine Bolduck. Here. 
Jason Nelson. Janelle Luauza. Here. Jordan Dibler. Here. George Durango Espin. Here. Joshua Reynolds. Here. Caitlin Farrar. Here. Kyle Quinn. Here. Lakin Meter. Here. Lewis Richardson. Here. Marie Missner. Here. Marissa Gillespie. Here. Matthew DeAngelis. Here. Megan Neely. Here. Michael DeBoten. Michael Jablonski. Here. Noah Robertson. Here. Patricia Brungy. Here. Raina Alexander. Here. Refugio Lara. Here. Ryan Lascalzo. Here. Samantha Brown. Here. Samuel Aja. Here. Sean Terry. Here. Selena Go. Here. Seth Constein. Here. Steven Zhang. Here. Sydney Gibbard. Here. Was there anyone's name that was not called? Seeing none. This meeting is adjourned at Wednesday, April 28th at 1056. Hags. Thank you. Bye, everyone.